Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everyone's joining. I got some test prep stuff today. It's going to be good. Don't forget to unmute yourselves, turn on your screens and whatnot. So real quick, while everyone's still logging in, um, Thursday, we'll do the exam on Thursday. So don't forget to bring a personal device. If you have um, a computer that, that's not going to work or something, I have an iPad here that you guys can use as well. Um, but just let me know as soon as you can that you cannot bring in an iPad or a laptop or something like that to take the test on. Um, or if you prefer doing a written test, um, please let me know as soon as uh as possible on that one so I can get some copies made for that as well. But Thursday's the test. Um, do be sure I put it in the announcement uh, for this week that you, if you want to bring a calculator, if you want to do those calculations by hand, that's more than fine. But if you want to bring a calculator, it's got to be a standalone. So it, it can't be the phone because phones and smartwatches need to be in your bag during exams. So uh, if you want to bring your own uh, little standalone calculator, that's fine. We do have a box of uh, those little calculators here uh, if you do not have one of those. But I do encourage you to get one of those little calculators because you can't carry your phone with you at the hospital uh, during clinical rotation. So you can carry the calculator with you. So it, it will behoove you, especially if you have to calculate stuff out there to have one of those little back to school type cal calculators with you. You can hide in a pocket. And then Thursday, we'll also do our checkoffs. I put that in the announcement as well. So not the official checkoff by me, but you guys will be doing peer checkoffs. So that means you'll be practicing the PFTs on each other. Um, I, we only have, I think we have two machines. I'm, I, be, I think I'll be able to get the other one up and running. That's one of my goals for today is get the other PFT machine up and running. So that way you'll have at least two machines everybody can practice on. Um, and I'll make it so it's still safe to do a PFT, even with the whole mask and indoor stuff. So I'll make that as safe as possible there. But I will have that to go on uh, Thursday as well. So after the test, the whole idea is to hands-on practice coaching each other through the PFDs and doing peer checkoffs. Now, it won't be your official checkoff where I'll have to observe you. We'll Put that in in a lab down the road, but I want you to have some hands-on practice doing that. And then today, if we have time permitting, do some breakout rooms where you guys can just practice doing the coaching techniques with each other. So on Thursday, I do encourage you to bring your chart if you made a chart or bring something that where you can coach people through the different PFTs, your little prompts that you have there. That's going to come in very handy on Thursday. Whew, that's a lot to say at the beginning. Then we're going to go into EKG world starting the week after. So next week we start EKGs. It's going to be fun. Uh, Gina and I are working on a ton of resources for that class. We have a bunch of QR codes, just like that PFT resource that I put in there. We have something like that for all the different heart rhythms that are uh, that that should be helpful. And then we have the mannequin that does all the different heart rhythms in the lab that I'll, we'll do a lot of rhythm recognition with as well. So uh, you'll get to see the baby go into all these different rhythms and we'll talk about them and what they mean, what we do with them, what causes them, how we treat them, things like that. So it's gonna be kind of fun, I hope. That's the plan is to make it fun. Applicable and fun. Real quick. All right, so as far as the announcements go, um, good job on the charts. Uh, most of you did the charts. Uh, good job on the charts overall. I did put those in as an MRE grade, so hopefully you've seen that little bump in your grade overall. I thought that would be a nice little bonus, so hopefully you didn't mind that. 
Um, but that did bump a lot of your grades in a positive direction. So um, that's something I did there. So if you did see your bump in a grade, it was because I turned that um, discussion post where it was either the video or the chart into an MRE grade. All right, I won't do that for the other post unless we have to or something like that, I don't know. But um, when we're looking at what's due today, as far as the announcements for what's due today, today is also a discussion post. So this is just your thing. You either can do, so you pick one of these two options. You're either gonna post to that discussion board a two-page study guide. So two-page study guide, so that's you bullet pointing the main points of the PFT information. Or if you don't want to do that, if that's not something you already have going on, that's not something that's useful to you, that's not something that's relevant to you, um, you can post five exam style questions. So you pick your option here. So you either do a two-page study guide where you bullet point the main points, some of the big things out there, or five exam style questions with answers, right? And the whole idea here is that you can go through other people's posts and sort of start quizzing yourself and seeing, do I know this information? Do I have this down? It helps you prepare sort of like what we're doing today with that escape room activity. So that's your option for today, either the study guide, and I'll try to give you enough time to do that today, a study guide or five exam style questions from the PFT information with answers, right? Put those answers like slide number 17 or whatever it is, or page number this, uh, in the Egan's book. Um, so don't forget about those. That is due today. So just either five exam style questions with answers or post your two page study guide, right? And this is meant for you guys to look at each other's uh, questions or study guides and start to look at do I have this information down? The sooner you start pr uh, preparing for the test on Thursday, the more it's going to be in your long term memory. So under stress of being in the classroom again, taking a test in the classroom again, I don't want that being a huge factor. I know it will be somewhat of a factor. But um, if you're able to sort of review today and almost pretend like the test is today, like you're cramming for the test today, sort of, Thursday is going to be a lot less stressful for you, especially Wednesday night into Thursday will be a lot less stressful for you. So the sooner you can do that, the better. Uh, but that's what's due today, right? Just do five questions with answers or the study guide. Thursday, the big thing there is exam one will take in class in on your device of some sort that you'll bring here. Just let me know ahead of time. Send me a quick email, um, ddavis at pmi.edu if you need a device or if you prefer a paper copy of the test. Uh, then be prepared to check each other off on the ppd.com, do peer checkoffs uh, like we did with Stacy last, I think it was Thursday. Um, so to do peer checkoffs with pulmonary function testing, and then we'll do the, the full lab checkoff later on down the road. We'll combine it in either the EKG or the ABG lab there. All right. Whew. Questions about the announcements or schedule or anything like that? Did it's over. Go ahead. On, on Thursday, we were... Uh, just jumping right into the exam where you say you were going to do like a brief review again real quick before the exam. Yeah, and I always do that too. So it's up to you. Um, if you want to, as a class, right? So this is where I leave it up to you as a class. Some classes, they're just, they're nervous. Their brain's not going to absorb anything the morning of or the day of the test. So they're just like, let's get it out. Like my brain is just full. I have anxiety. I'm not going to retain anything. Let's just start the test. So some people, some classes as a course love to do that. Uh, other classes like, hey, let's do a quick review. What are some of the main points? Derek, can you explain best test again real quick? And maybe something will sneak in uh, right before you take the test, right? So that's up to you as a course. So if you want to, I'll obviously be here early, right? I usually am here around 740 or so at the latest. But um, if you want to come in early, quiz each other, uh, I'll be in here, right? I'll, I'll be here to help you guys out if you want to do some of that review beforehand as well. That's up to you. But yeah, if you want to start up with, hey, explain this, explain that, or let's talk about this one more time, that's okay. And that's exactly what I'm here for. I'm here to help you be as awesome as you possibly can be as much as I can help you there. So if you want to do a review beforehand, I'll be here early and you could do that. Uh, we don't have to start the test right away. Um, but if you, if the, you as a class, 
uh, deemed it valuable to do a quick review, some of the main points, do a quick review on best tests, quick review on the different breathing techniques, things like that. We can do that. Especially since we don't have lecture right after the test, right? What? Reverse teaching is awesome. Um, so I want you to be hands on. The cool thing about this course is it's hands on and we're just not there yet, but we'll get there <laughs> right now that we get to spend a lot of lab time. Now that you guys are coming back, it's going to be so much fun. Um, and then yelling at each other, doing PFTs, we'll do a couple separate stations. And the whole point is just to get hands on coaching the different PFTs. Um, yeah, get more comfortable with the procedures, right? You should be comfortable through this course. You should be comfortable with the procedure of PFT coaching, comfortable with the procedure of performing an EKG, comfortable with the procedure of performing an arterial blood gas stick, and then comfortable with sort of the setup for a bronchoscopy. I won't say that you'll be doing the bronch, but the setup for a bronchoscopy as well. Those should be things that will be hands-on comfort comfortable for you hopefully that's my plan uh so that way you have that sort of that muscle memory if you will that connection to it not just the academic stuff although i love the academic stuff sorry Gary, i took which, jason's question all right go ahead which textbook do we have with uh, thursday so Thursday, if you want to bring the Understanding EKGs textbook, uh, if you want to start on that. So what I recommend is when we're doing the peer checkoffs is if you're not doing the PFTs, if you're not doing the PFTs, I'll repeat that again, then start looking at the EKG information. So that's the Understanding EKG books. It's a very small book, right? It's a very thin book. Not small, but thin book. Uh, and that's the book that we're going to start off with next is under, there it is, Jason's holding it up. The Understanding EKG's book. So I recommend starting to look at that. Yes. Um, so that's going to be very helpful. The sooner you start, like I said, the toughest part of this course is usually the Understanding EKG's part, right? If you don't have a background in EKG's, that's usually the toughest part. Uh, like I said, I'm Currently, I'm in cahoots with Gina to help break this down a little bit more simply to make it more digestible, but I would recommend starting to look at that book, starting to look at that one there. It's very short, very readable. It has a lot of examples and even um, questions in the back there. Uh, I'm not going to make those questions required or anything, but it's good to start, start early on the EKG section because that seems like it's going to be a lot very quickly. So I recommend bringing that for Thursday. The other thing I recommend, Oaks. All right, I have sticky notes on it. But your Oaks book that has some EKG information in there, just like the PFT information. And I believe it's the chapter right after the PFT information where it actually breaks down. Um, like if you go to, if you have your Oaks in front of you, if you go to 8-13, just as an example, if you go to 8-13, you're going to see a bunch of heart rhythms. And it's going to say, hey, these are the causes of this. This is what it's going to look like. And this is what's going to happen with it. So little things like that can be very helpful on getting a good overview picture of the EKG world that we'll start in on. So if you want to bring your little Oaks books, that not, that's not a bad idea, especially since we'll still be doing PFTs that day as well. You can see I'm a big believer in keeping it simple to digest it and then going in on the details as you understand it in general. <laughs> I don't want you to get lost in all the details. The PR interval is one small box and so on and so forth and so on. So I don't want you to get lost in all those details. I want you to get the big picture and then we can zoom in on those little academic details once we got the big picture down. So understanding EKGs and the Oaks books is what I would recommend. If you want to bring your EGANs, you are free to do so. If you feel like you need the workout, carrying it up the stairs, go for it. But I don't have any plans for you to use your EGANs book on Thursday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's up to you. It's a good CrossFit uh, Pima, right? Just with the EGANs book, yeah. Not affiliated with CrossFit, but all right. 
other questions. I took those questions and made them too long. No, waking up. Yeah, I get it. You're in farm too, and farm's just a fast and quick class, and it's a lot of information and it's fast. Um, Thursday, the test. Uh, hopefully, you feel ready for it. If you did the, uh, if you stayed on the Zoom the other day, once again, I put those Zoom links under the resources content. If you stayed on the Zoom link the other day, I did or want to go back and watch it. I did go through the worksheet uh, with those who stayed, so I do recommend that. If you haven't gone through that worksheet, please, please, please go through that worksheet. That's very good information. It should help clarify. Make sure, like I said before, I made that worksheet to make sure that you got the most out of the lecture, right? I made that worksheet to make sure you got the most out of the lecture. Same thing with the best test worksheet. We did some of that as well. I want to make sure you got that down because am I going to be asking you for best test? Absolutely. Am I going to be asking you to interpret different PFTs? Absolutely, right? So that's the case study. So that's why I want to do that second case study today as well case study number two, as well as the respiratory escape room, which has a lot of good questions on it to make sure you got the information down. And it's a little fun. Couldn't hurt. All right, you have your volume and capacity box just in your brain. If you wanna bring scrap paper for um, Thursday as well. Uh, like if you have to memory dump, we called it memory dumping. Uh, right before the test, you have your blank piece of paper. And then once we start it, if you want to memory dump the volume and capacity box, if you want to memory dump other things, uh, you are free to do so as well. Uh, just after you're done with your scrap paper, you do have to turn it in. That's all I ask. Turn it in. That does that with the board exams. You'll, it's still a computer test, but any scrap paper you use, you have to turn into the um, testing facility as well. So that's nothing new. That's something that you'll be seeing down the road sooner than later. I am excited you all are in the second semester. You're so close to clinicals. All right, other things. Other things you want to question, talk about before we get into the content? I guess I it's a little thing for everybody else. I went to go get my, uh, sorry, my background check and my drug screen. I don't know if y'all haven't done that yet, but I forgot my piece of paper that they emailed oh. me. So I, I went to the place and I just had to turn around and go back home because I didn't have it. And I couldn't find it in my email. It was in my junk folder. Oh. So don't forget to take that with you. When you go to quest to get that done, because now I gotta go I'm back. I'm sorry, over Jason, again. that totally sucked. I was all right. I mean, I was like, had to go out and run errands anyways, and I was just like, I was like, I turned back around. Yeah, I couldn't go in the cup, and they had the bathrooms closed at Safeway, so I had to like haul it back home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, definitely don't forget your uh, your number they give you; otherwise, you can't do it. Good to know. All right. Anything else? Burning questions? No? Are you done with PFTs? You're like, I'm just done with it <laughs> at this point. All right. So hopefully that little resource guide that I put together with the QR codes and all that stuff was useful to you during that uh, other assignment that you were doing. Um, so today uh, I have the case studies and then I have the review for the exam. So the, um, the game. So I have the escape room. Which would you guys like to do first? I have both ready to go. If the game could wake you up, the uh, case studies could wake you up. Which one sounds more intriguing? The case study. Case study. All right. So let's go ahead and do this. This should be right under the other case study. Um, 
and it has the PFT information. I think it included a pre and post uh, bronchodilator study in here, which is very common to do at the bedside in the hospital. So we would come out of the PFT lab, come out of our dungeon and uh, go do the pre and post at the bedsides. Uh, we did that quite a bit for some of our patients. So let's go ahead and do that. And then I'll pull it up. If you want to pull it up and follow along with me, you can do so. Uh, if you just want to follow along, just listening to my calming, relaxing voice, you're free to do so as well there. Um, so we'll start. I did singers in this one for some reason, but uh, we'll go with this one. All right. So I need participation. That's the big thing out of you all. I need the participation. Same thing when we go to the escape room, it'll be one person at a time, starting with Ashley, going all the way down to Terry, one person at a time answering those questions. So uh, participation is going to be the fun part about this. All right. Here's the scenario. You are a respiratory therapist assigned in the critical care unit at a level one trauma center in Florida. Uh oh, Derek, I thought you said this was a, a, a PFT case study. It is. <laughs> right, it is. All right, you receive a direct admit. He's a ventilated patient, so he's on mechanical ventilation. From a rural hospital, he's currently on a ventilator with the chief complaint of respiratory distress. So he was intubated, he was placed on a ventilator for respiratory distress, and you're going to get him to come to your facility in your ICU. He is a 77-year-old thin-framed male. He, has a he had a progressive onset of worsening dyspnea. What does that mean? The short of breath. Yeah, he felt short of breath, and it, it came over the past 48, 72 hours. So he started getting really, really short of breath. All right. He is 177.8 centimeters tall. That's how they do it in a lot of hospitals. They tell you how tall they are in centimeters. So what's your conversion factor? Because you got to figure out inches when you're talking about tidal volumes and ideal body weight and a lot of other stuff. Like even our PFTs are in inches, right? So how do you convert 177.8 to inches? What's your conversion factor? Divide by 2.5. 2.54, good job. Yep, so you divide by 2.54. So how tall is Jagger? So you got 70 inches, so. Would it be 70 inches? Yeah. There you go. 5'10". Thank you. Yeah, 60 inches is five foot. So 70 inches is 5'10". All right, the physician is in a procedure and asks you to evaluate and treat per protocol. So here's your physical exam. He's on a ventilator. He has a tidal volume of 420 ml. Sounds like I'm going to ask you to do some calculations in a second. Uh, he's set at a tidal volume of 420 ml. And the flow rate is 60 liters per minute. Uh, he's returning 430 ml on average. It takes the ventilator 15 centimeters of water pressure to deliver the breath. It sounds like the PFT world's gonna be coming in useful here. What is his lung compliance? Because does compliance tell us about pulmonary function? Yes, no, no, yes. Yes, because it can tell you if you've got like stiffer lungs or kind of floppy lungs. So you're saying it could tell us if we have a restrictive disease process or not. <gasps> yes, we need to know because that'll help us run mechanical ventilation more effectively, right? So what is his lung compliance? So the, the calculation for lung compliance is? Isn't it pressure divided by volume? Is it pressure divided by volume? Is it the volume unit, over pressure. Yeah, volume over pressure. So the unit is mLs per centimeter of water pressure. mLs per centimeter of water pressure. So it'd be 420 over 15. 15. What's that? The answer is 28. 28. So is that a normal lung compliance? It's really low. 
Yeah, that's really low. So does he have a restrictive disease process? Yes or no? Yes. 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 <gasps> so we now know his lungs are super small. So he had trouble breathing in with his dyspnea. We can extrapolate that from what we've gathered so far. What? He's learning critical care medicine and PFT land, right? All right. What is his airway resistance? What's the calculation for airway resistance? Is that pressure divided by flow rate? Pressure divided by flow in? Liters per second. Yeah, so you have to convert this. So I, I left it easy for you out there. <laughs> So you have to convert it. So what does airway resistance tell us? Does that tell us about restrictive disease or obstructive disease? Obstructive. Obstructive. Do <gasps> you guys see where I'm going at with this? Right, that this information carries over to critical care medicine. Okay, so you got to convert this to liters per second before you plug it into the calculation. So that one's pretty easy. 60 over 60 is what? One. So 15 over 1 is? 15. So what's his raw? Fifteen. Fifteen. Liters per second. Centimeters H2O per liter per second. There you go. Centimeters of water per liter per second. Whew. It's almost like I'm bringing pulmonary AMP back into this. It's like there was a purpose behind it. All right, so 15, normal, high, low? That's high. High. Yeah. So based upon what you see with his compliance and his raw, what type of pathophysiologies is currently going on with him? Just in general. Is like oh. mixed. Mixed or combined, right? Restrictive and obstructive pathophysiology is going on. We didn't even do a PFT and we already know what's going on, right? Because we're looking at lung function by looking at these values, right? All right. Continue on looking. That's me nerding out with equations. But you, every time you go in to do a ventilator assessment on patients, we calculate their compliance. We look at the raw because we need to trend and see which direction this patient's going, right? It tells us about lung function and lung health. So bring it out. All right. You know, he has diaphoresis, which means? He's sweating. He's sweating. Good thing or bad thing? Bad. Bad, right? Pallor, which means what? Pale. Pale, right? Good thing or bad thing, all right? That tells you about yeah. perfusion. Bad. Okay. Accessory muscles while under the while on mechanical ventilation. <gasps> He's using accessory muscles to breathe on a ventilator. Is that a good thing? No. And that's probably why he's sweating. So is he looking so healthy right now? No, not even close. So he's in critical condition, right? It's pretty bad. He has a significant smoking history, one and a half pack days over the last 60 years. Uh, he has a diagnosis of COPD and lung cancer. So does that impact the way the air goes into and out of his lungs, having that history of and diagnosis of COPD and lung cancer? Does that impact air going in and air going out? So it's important to know that his expiratory flow rates would be prolonged prolonged and low. So can I set a really fast respiratory rate on his breathing machine? No. So you're saying it's good that I know obstructive disease can take a long time to empty. What? Right? I'm doing these things on purpose. I hope you see that, right? He had a history of a heart valve replacement the past year, aortic valve replacement. So his heart's not the greatest of shape, uh, but there's no speedum noted. That's good news. Breast sounds are clear, uh, but diminish his right breast sounds are louder than his left side breast sounds. All right, these are his vital signs. What do you see? Tachycardia. He's tachycardic, that's for sure. That's not great for someone that's had a heart valve replacement. 
He's to Kipnick. To Kipnick and on, on a ventilator, he's to Kipnick. That's not good. His body's telling him he needs to breathe fast on a ventilator and working hard to breathe. So we need to check a blood gas on this guy. Yes or no? Yeah. All right. Well, let's finish with the vital signs. What do you notice about that blood pressure? A little bit high. He's on the hypertensive side. So he could be under pain, right? Things like that could be going on. Pain, agitation. There's a number of things that could be causing that. Sympathetic stimulation. Or am I bringing up bad things if I talk about farm stuff? I don't know. All right. Temperature. That's, that's normal, right? 36.5 to 37.5 was within normal limits. So is he sweating because he's febrile? No. All right. Bringing that out. See, so if you were thinking infection, is that a possibility right now? No, not necessarily. All right. His pulse ox uh, is 90% on 70% oxygen. Right. That's why on a lot of FiO2, that's a lot of FiO2. He's only at 90%. His SpO2 heart rate was noted to be 83. So on the pulse ox heart rate, it's 83, but on the monitor, it's 121. What do you do with this information? Do you believe the heart rate on the pulse ox or do you believe the heart rate on the EKG monitor? The EKG. Why? Wasn't it off somehow on the pulse ox? Yeah, it's probably off. So that's how you know if your pulse ox, one of the ways you know if your pulse ox is actually being accurate is comparing it to an EKG monitor on that patient right? Or manually palpating the pulse while they, you have the pulse locks on them if they're not on a monitor. So this is floor therapy. I'm helping you guys out, right? So if you're on the floors and you don't believe the heart rate on the pulse locks, palpate the pulse at the same time. Do you see yeah, it? Hey Derek, can Go you ahead. do it yourself then? Like, is that what you're saying? You do it like you check the pulse yourself? Yeah, so you check, you palpate the pulse yourself with your own fingers and you count it out, right? You have your little watch and you count it out oh, or there's a clock in the room. Half of those are broken most of the time, but uh, you, that's why I always believe in having your own, right? Whether it's like hanging on your scrubs or whatever, right? Because they make those lanyard watches like Swatch makes those or whatever, but um, you, you, you manually palpate it and you count it out and compare it to what the pulse ox is saying to know if it's, it's, it's accurately picking up perfusion. So a three lead is going to be a good way to compare it to, or if you don't have a three lead, manually palpate and compare your heart rate that you palpated versus the pulse ox heart rate. Does that make sense? So how accurate currently is his pulse ox? Ashley says, no, it's not, right? It's not picking up the perfusion. So if it's not picking up perfusion, how does it read oxygen levels appropriately? We don't know. So it sounds like there might be a different test that's the gold standard for oxygen assessment. ABG. There you go. I love this. So I'm hearing you say you want to get an arterial blood gas, right? Is it indicated? Yeah. Why? What makes, what are, what's the indication? Because the pulse ox is saying something different from the EKG and he's uh, diaphoretic and having difficulty breathing. So you're saying that one indication is oxygen evaluation. Yeah. What I'm hearing you say, and then the other indication, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I'm just trying to say it differently a little bit. The other indication I hear you say is for ventilation assessment because he's working hard to breathe. So we need to look at his CO2 and pH levels to see what's causing him to work so hard to breathe. Different way of putting it, but that's what you said. Oxygenation and ventilation is what I ultimately heard you. Am yeah, I putting I mean, words in your mouth or? Difficulty no. breathing, I mean, is that like as far as you need to go with it or no? Well, each one of those is its own. So if I see someone working hard to breathe, someone comes into the ER, let's say they're emphysema patient, COPD patient, they come into the ER and they're working hard to breathe. That's just alone. And let's say their oxygen levels are fine. Just that alone is actually an indication for an arterial blood gas. Does that mean what we're required to do it? No. Does it mean the patient can't refuse it? No, it just means that that's the gold standard for really looking at how much CO2 and their pH balance is in their bloodstream. 
but both oxygenation, just someone comes in, they're ventilating just fine, but their oxygen levels are super low for some reason or another. Maybe we need to get a blood gas because the gold standard for oxygenation is arterial blood gas. Whether or not they're ventilating, working hard to breathe or not, their oxygen levels are low and we need to see exactly what they are. So each of those is its own indication. He has both. So he, he actually meets indications in a couple of check boxes for it. Did that answer? Yeah, thank you. Oh, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. What about a chest x-ray? Someone has difficulty breathing, they're on life support, they're having trouble getting oxygen into their bloodstream. Could a chest x-ray help us see why? Especially with breast sounds being louder on one side versus the other, could a chest x-ray be indicated at this time? Yeah. Why? Uh, what would we see that would help us? Maybe his tube's displaced or something like that. The tube could be deep. It could be high, right? It could be above the vocal cords. I've seen that happen a couple of times where it works, especially in transport, right? It can work its way up. What we else? also see like if his lung cancer has gotten like, like has spread to other parts of his lung, like maybe the tumor has grown on the right side. No, or whatever yeah, and it could finish. be it could be blocking airflow to different sections. I've seen that, especially right upper lobe is the most common place for a tumor uh, for lung cancer patients, um, for smoking lung cancer patients, I should say. I'll clarify that further. So it usually blocks off airflow to that right upper lobe. And so you can see that on the x-ray too. And then if he has a pneumonia, are people that have COPD, remember they paralyze the mucosal escalator and they're more prone to pulmonary infections. Could he also have a pneumonia that we can then verify on x-ray? Absolutely. He has his perfusion status, right? Remember, he was pale. Could we also look at the cardiac silhouette and see if there's cardiomegaly, like he has heart failure going on, or other things like that going on with cardiovascular status? Absolutely. So x-ray, he has a lot of indications for it. So that's a good idea. All right. What about doing a bedside spirometry? Would he Would you, probably be too weak for that? Yeah, he's on a ventilator. Yeah. Yeah. Him. So uh, probably not at this time. Now down the road, yes. But yeah, remember, this is a non-emergent, more of a, a, a healthy-ish patient type thing, more of a floor patient that can speak and talk to you and follow instructions. He's on a ventilator. So probably not at this time. Remember, it's one of those um, diagnose, treat. That's why we use the ventilator to give us raw and compliance and tell us about lung function and gas exchange, which is what PFTs tell us about lung function, gas exchange. What? I'm bringing correlation. I'm bringing things together. I'm connecting puzzle pieces, right? Hopefully you see that, right? Okay. All right. Uh, what about a 12-lead EKG? So his three-lead on the monitor that we've seen, he had a tachycardia. His perfusion, he had a hypertension, but his perfusion was sort of pallor, right? So could, is there a, um, could the dyspnea also be from a cardiovascular issue. Now, he does have a history of aortic valve replacement. Do we need to look for cardiovascular issues? Because remember, what delivers oxygen to our tissues? Cardiovascular. So, could, yeah. is there an indication for a 12-lead uh, EKG? Yes. Yes. Absolutely, right? Because we want to see how well his heart is functioning. And the EKG is a, a visual representation of the heart's electrical activity and how much stress is going on on that heart, right? And a 12 lead looks at a lot more detail than the little three lead monitor, right? At Swedish, who does the 12 leads? Us, right? The RT. So you could be at facilities where you're the RT doing the EKG as well. All right, this is his ABG results. What's the interpretation? He's on a ventilator, so he has a stable tidal volume, stable minute ventilation, stable FiO2. What's his interpretation?
So it doesn't look good, but I'm not 100% why, if we're being perfectly honest here. Is Isn't it like a low? mixed? Sorry, what? Would it be a partially compensated respiratory acidosis with uncorrected hypoxemia? Uncorrected with the PO2 of above 60? It'd be corrected. Oh, corrected. Uh, corrected hypoxemia. So let's start at the beginning here, right? Since it's been a hot minute since we've gone over the the, the basics of AKG, uh, a, a, ABG interpretation. Uh, pH of 730 is? Acidic. Acidic. So he has an acidosis, right? He has an acidosis. A CO2 of 60 is? Acidic. Acidic. So we know he has a respiratory acidosis going on, right? We can blame respiratory acidosis. All right. Um, bicarb of 32. Basic. Basic. So his body is trying to compensate for the respiratory acidosis. Is it fully compensated by having a normal pH? No. So it's partially compensated. It's not fully compensated. So this is a partially compensated respiratory acidosis. You guys see how we got there? Okay, now he's on oxygen. And as long as the PO2 is between 60 and 100, it's considered corrected hypoxemia. So it's PO2 61, so he has corrected hypoxemia. This is a classic blood gas of a COPD patient that goes into respiratory failure. This is a classic blood gas of a COPD patient that goes into respiratory failure. The cool thing about this, if you see this on a vented patient, can we correct for this? Yeah, we have the ability to help them ventilate more effectively on a breathing machine. So what would you do? You know that he has a long expiratory time constant because of his COPD. So can you bump up the respiratory rate on the ventilator and hope for the best? Because if you bump up the respiratory rate, what's going to happen with his air trapping, his auto peep? Is he going to ventilate better or worse if that if you bump up the respiratory rate? Worse. Worse. Okay. So I know would, we're... You, would you make it so that he has a longer expiratory? Yeah, you want a longer expiratory time constant. Absolutely. So that way he can completely empty his lungs, right? Remember when I was being coached? I don't remember if it was Jason or someone. Someone was coaching me through the, the force vital maneuver, and I was lasting a little bit longer than six because of my asthma, right? Because it takes me that extra because my small airways are small airways. <laughs> so that's what you're looking at here is do we want to help him ventilate more effectively? Well, with his disease process, I can be a good critical care provider and understand his disease process and it needs to have a longer expiratory time constant. So if I give him a faster flow rate to deliver his breath, then I'm going to have a longer expiratory time to allow for that breath to come all the way out. So even if I make his flow rate for the ventilator faster, I'm going to actually help ventilate him better. Without turning up his tidal volume, without increasing the ventilator pressure or volume, I can make him breathe more effectively but by just giving him the gas faster. That's it, because it allows for more time for him to exhale. That's all I'm doing. I'm giving him a longer IDE ratio. This is his chest x-ray. All right, I know we haven't got over chest x-rays. That's part of this course. Uh, does it look normal? No, what do you notice? What's going on with his right lung? Yeah, something bad is going on with that right lung. Heart is with the normal limits. This is the aortic arch, your left atria, and then, of course, your left ventricle. Um, look at how tall and columnar these, I used columnar, uh, sounds scientific, but uh, how tall and column looking that left lung is. That's a classic emphysema COPD look, is that tall column-like lung because of the stretched out loss of elasticity, lung disease that's going on there. Right lung doesn't look like that. You can see the upper lobe, but I can't see anything below that. Here's the carina. You guys see this where it looks like this little Y here? 
There you go. There's main carina, right? And that's usually around the second intercostal. <gasps> what? We learned that in pulmonary AMP. And then when we do a 12 lead, we go to the fourth intercostal space. So you feel the sternal angle and then go down two ribs. And that's where you do leads one and two on each side. I'm previewing a little bit here. But obviously that right lower lung, we got nothing going on down there. So what do you think is going on here? Just guesses. There's no aeration. There's no gas movement down here, obviously. Would that be like obstruction? Or... Would this be obstruction or? Restrictive. Restrictive, right? Remember, he has both going on because his compliance was low and he has COPD, right? So he has an obstructive disease. Now he's got a restrictive on top of it. Does this look like a classic pneumonia? I will tell you now it does not. But there's something that's restricting that right lung. Does it look like it's pulmonary tissue that's being restricted, or does it look like something that's restricting the tissue from the outside? Tissue. Sorry, I heard a bunch of people at once there. A pulmonary effusion? A plural effusion? Yes. <laughs> right? It's pushing up on the right lung. So there's a lot of fluid in there. What's that fluid doing to that right lung? Squishy, squishy, right? It's not going to allow it to expand. So do lung cancer patients have recurrent pleural fusions? Do heart patients have reoccurring pleural fusions? Yes. Would that make it difficult for him to breathe in? And with his baseline disease, would it make it difficult for him to breathe out? Could he tire out and go into respiratory fatigue? Are you guys starting to see where we're going at with all this information? Yes? I don't know. This is always exciting for me, at least. All right, so his lung function. Not only does he have poor lung function getting gas out, but now it's poor lung function getting gas in, right, to move that fluid out of the way. All right, this is his 12 lead EKG. I know you're like, Derek, this looks crazy. So down at the bottom here is lead two. If you see my mouse, if you see my mouse, the very bottom here on the on this left yeah. hand side. Okay, so this is lead two. So there's a P wave, QRS complex, and a T wave. So for every P wave, there should be a QRS complex, is what I've seen Miranda uh, mouth, right? Thanks, trach patient history. I can read lips a little bit. All right, uh, so every P wave has a QRS complex. That's a good sign. The P waves are round, not sharp and jagged. Um, the QRS complex, is that narrow or really wide, like a big box wide? Is it narrow or wide? Narrow. Narrow, that's a good sign too, right? <laughs> These are all just good general signs that we'll just go over here. So does it look like there's a lot of crazy things going on with what you can see down here? Does it look like a very abnormal rhythm? Does it look pretty consistent with how many boxes there are in between the R waves? Does that look very consistent? That would be a regular rhythm if there was. Does that look consistent between R to R, R to R? Yes. So does it look like there's a, some very serious cardiovascular pathology that we can see right now on here? No. No. So this helps rule out some things, doesn't it? Right? Do I see an ST elevation that could look like a heart attack going on, right? Like a STEMI, ST, myocardial infarction, a STEMI? I don't see that, right? And that would be in multiple leads, right? So I'm not seeing those things. So could this help with sort of ruling out cardiovascular issues? Absolutely. So it was valuable even if it didn't show anything crazy. All right. What do you think caused his issue? Why did he have so much uh, shortness of breath? Why did he go into respiratory failure? Why is he on the ventilator? It was a pleural effusion restricting his lung. Yeah. So the pleural fusion on top of baseline pulmonary disease, right? That's that comorbidity there. So... Question, restricted pathology, obstructive pathology, or combined pathology? Maybe combined. Combined, right? He had his baseline disease, his baseline COPD, lung cancer, and now he combined it with a pleural fusion, right? Uh, ooh, going back to the VQ PowerPoint, shunt or dead space? Remember, dead space, if you're not perfusing, you're dead. So dead space is, is ventilation with no blood flow. So something's wrong with the perfusion. Something's wrong with cardiovascular status. 
and it shunts the opposite. So that means you're, you have poor oxygenation, you have poor ventilation, but your blood flow is doing okay. Oh, you had a shunt? Yes, right? This is shunt pathophysiology. So is this a cardiovascular fix? Do we put him on heart medicine? Do we put him on a ton of saline through his IVs to fix this? Do we give him red blood cells? Is that the fix for this? No. No, because that would be dead space fix. Yeah, and his blood flow, you said, is good with the shunt. Yeah, so now we need to figure out what's the primary cause of his shunting. And in his case, he has some cause with his baseline disease, but what's primarily causing a shunt right now? Pleural fusion. Pleural fusion. So we need to tap that, right? We need to do a thoracentesis to drain it or put in a chest tube. Does that make sense? That's what it's causing that shunt because he has blood flow. But what happened to all that tissue? It gets squished up. Is it able to ventilate if you have tissue that's just closed up? You can't ventilate tissue that's closed up, right? It has good perfusion, but it's closed up. So that's shunting. I have perfusion that's not ventilating. All right. So he has shunt like pathophysiology. Can we fix it? Yeah. Work the cause. Don't just put turn down, turn it up his flow rate on the ventilator and leave the room. No, you're part of the team. What are some of the fixes here, right? Hey, what are the thoughts on a chest tube? What are the thoughts on a, a thoracentesis, right, to remove that fluid? All right, so why the tachycardia, hypertension, hypercarbia, and low saturation? What, what's the deal with those? Why, why was that there with his presentation? Why were those present? Because his body was compensating. Yeah, it's compensating for that shunt pathophysiology, right? That's the whole thing there is the tachycardia, that blood pressure, it's hypercarbia. That's all a response to what was going on with his body. All right, therapy. I sort of already previewed this. What would you recommend or what, are your, what would you ask the care team about? Thoracentesis. A thoracentesis or, or a, a, a chest tube, right, to drain that. Uh, as well. There you go. How do you guys feel about that one? I know it's not your classic PFT case study, but I want you to sort of see where the lung function world, the PFT world, crosses over to critical care side. Right? Yeah, put it all together. Yeah. You're like, Derek, can't believe it. Right? Yeah. The more you know, understand pulmonary pathophysiology, the better critical care provider you're going to be. Right? Straightforward. Right, speaking the truth here. All right, you ready for another one? Am I boring you a little bit? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. All right, oh, and this is the chart. I put this in here. This is the NIH chart. Um, so when we talk about putting people on a ventilator, uh, so he was five foot 10, right? Jagger was five foot 10. So his ideal body weight or predicted body weight here was 73 kilos per his height, right? And so when we go over to see how many mLs per kilo he was on, he was on roughly around six mLs per kilo for his tidal volume because he was on 420. Uh, so 440. Um, so he was on um, a little bit under. So he was a little bit under six uh, per kilo. He wasn't quite at five per kilo. So that's a good tidal volume range. So what's the normal tidal volume for all land dwelling mammals in mLs per kilo? This was a, a pulmonary MP question. So five to seven. Five to seven mLs per kilo per ideal body weight. Yeah. So right around six per kilo, is that an appropriate tidal volume to put them on a ventilator with? Yeah. Does that make sense? So if you know your height and all that other stuff, you can figure out what yours would be here too. Uh, this is something I printed out and put on the back of my badge for the hospital, right? So someone comes in, I know they're five foot eight, uh, they're female, their ideal body weight 68 kilos. I want to start them at six mLs per kilo. I put them on 380 for the ventilator. That would be their set tidal volume. Right, so this is something, a good quick thing for when you do ICUs down the road. But I just want you to sort of see that. All right, a little share. Gotta love it. All right, you're an RIT, you're working in an outpatient diagnostics lab. So now you're you're done with the critical care unit for that day. You have a 74-year-old thin frame female, uh, scheduled pulmonary function test, diagnosed with moderate persistent asthma. 
So just off the board, what are you expecting to see if she has moderate persistent asthma? An increased raw and then the increased intrapulmonary pressure with decreased flow rates. Yep, decreased flow rates, increased raw, but that type of thing. Uh, she was recently hosting an outdoor event while a pollen that she was sensitive to was in the air and it triggered her asthma. So there's two types of asthma. There's extrinsic where you're uh, triggered by extrinsic factors like pollen and all that other stuff. Then there's intrinsic asthma where it's triggered by internal uh, things like inflammatory re mediator responses, things like that. So she has extrinsic asthma and we'll talk about that in disease class. All right, she was able to get herself under control. Good for her. But the pulmonologist wanted her to go to the lab and get some basic spirometry, pre and post bronchodilator. What are we looking at with that test? What's the purpose? Her reversibility. Reversibility. So that should tell us how effective that drug is, right? The, the bronchodilators are in her th therapy overall. All right physical exam. She states, I'm feeling a little lightheaded after walking to my parking spot from the walking from my parking spot to the lab. So should you just do the PFT right away if they're feeling short of breath? No, that's your time to talk about the weather and the smoke in the air and how bad that is for their, right? That's your time to sort of just do their background, their questions, things like that. So you want to give them some time to catch their breath. This is very common because why is that patient most likely in your PFT lab? Because they have trouble breathing and why are they there? They're probably having shortness of breath from walking all the way there from their car. All right. So she denies the following. Hemoptysis, pneumothorax, uh, myocardial infarction that's recent, uh, PE, all right, there's not an MIPE, but an MI comma, pulmonary, uh, 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 pulmonary emboli, uh, chest pain, cataract removal, and dementia. So she denies all those major contraindications. You're like, Derek, do I need to know contraindications for Thursday? Okay. When asked how often she uses her inhaler, she responds, I only take it when I have breathing symptoms about once a day or so. So should be, she be taking it that often? No. So that's that mild persistent. That's, that's pretty frequent to be taking a short acting bronchodilator. She denies any recent infections. That's good, right? Because we want to see her at her baseline for the pre and post. Any known heart issues? None of that. Uh, auscultation. She has some polyphonic wheezy. Ooh. Fancy word, what does that mean? Polyphonic wheezing. Is it several different types of wheezing? Yeah, you can hear different tones, right? Just like if you go to a piano and you press different keys, you hear different tones. You hear different tones of wheeze within the breath sound. That usually means that that's more of multiple small airways, different size small airways, like an organ, right? Different small airways that are that are closing at different rates, and that's what's causing those different sounds that's going on there. If you hear a monophonic wheeze, like Strider, <gasps> <gasps> that's monophonic. It's one tone and it's usually an obstruction that it's going through. And, right, if you're polyphonic, it's many obstructions. So that's usually more of an asthmatic type wheeze. All right, vital signs, what do you see? Is the heart, heart rate low? Oh, well, low looks good, except a little bit to kip neck slightly. Is 20 within normal range for an adult? Yeah. All good. So is anything outside of normal range? No. Yeah. That's good. So she managed herself pretty well, right? So during a uh, severe asthmatic uh, response, are you going to see a tachycardia? Yes. Are you going to see tachypnea? Yes. You're going to see all those things. So is she currently in a severe exacerbation? No, so this is a perfect time for this, right? All right, now you guys get to do your whole pre and post bronchodilator stuff. All right, so what do you see on her pre bronchodilator? You do a PFT. Which maneuver are we doing for this? Slow vital, MVV, what are we doing for this? Which maneuver would we do for a pre and post?
Would it be a peak flow meter? You could, in theory, do a peak flow. We do want to look at the, I'll give you a hint, we do want to look at the FEV 1%. Would it be a uh, force vital? Force vital capacity, right? So in theory, you could use a peak flow. Um, that is how we've done it in the past. Uh, and you could, in theory, do that at the bedside. Is it going to be as valuable or accurate? That's position dependent. I'll put it that way. <laughs> But traditionally, the best way to do it is a force vital capacity. And you're looking at the FEV 1%. All right. So we do a pre-bronchodilator PFT on her. What do you notice? What's the interpretation that you get from this pre-bronchodilator PFT? What do you see? And we did a slow vital on her, which is good, especially if we think she has obstructive disease. So she have low volume. No. Good thing you did a slow bottle capacity, right? Because otherwise it would look like she has a combined. Smart move. You've been trained well. <laughs> All right. Uh, so force bottle capacity is low, but her slow bottle capacity is normal. FEV1 one to FEC is? Low. Low, which is your gold standard, FEV1%, which is your gold standard for? Evaluating obstructive obstructive lung disease, right? FEV1. All right, 25 to 75 tells you about big airways or small airways? Small. 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 Is that normal? 63%? Nope. Uh, 200 to 1200, big airways or small airways? Big airways, like your trachea, vocal cords, things like that, right? Peak expiratory flow rate, 68%, right? So that would be like the peak flow, like what Chris was saying, right? So that's low. So is this restrictive, obstructive, or combined for her pre-bronchodilator? Kara says obstructive. Agree, disagree? Feel like I'm losing y'all. All right, post bronchodilator. All right, these are her percents of predicted. What did you see? Sorry, what did you see? FVC improved. FVC, uh, it improved. How much? Because what are we looking for? FVC to improve by how much in mLs? I didn't give you the mLs, but how many mLs would we want to look for it to improve by? 200 mLs. 200 mLs, right? All right, but the other thing we're looking at for, for a positive bronchodilator response would be what? What's the other value we look at for pre and post? Your FEV1. FEV1 percent. <laughs> we want to see it increase by at least? 12%. 12%. So we went from 65 to 79. Did we get that response? Chriselle says yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So is she reactive to it? Does a short acting a beta agonist, a Saba, does that impact her? Does that help her reverse her airway issues? There you go. What? Right. So that shows the reversibility of her airways. So why was there different between the pre and post, right? The pre-study had normal volumes or low volumes? Low. Normal well, the force vital was low because why was the force vital low compared to the slow vital? Because of the restricted airways or obstructed airways. Yeah, the air trapping is what you're pretty much saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when we force it out, it prematurely closes, traps that gas in there. So that's why the slow vital on obstructive patients can come in pretty handy there. The pre-study had low or normal flow rates. Low. Low, right. All right. The post study had low or normal volumes? Normal. Normal, right. The post study had what flow rates, low or normal? Normal. Normal, right. So we brought her back to a good baseline. So what PFT can she do at home? This is where someone already said this. What PFT can she do at home to see how her asthma is doing at home, whether or not she needs to take her Saba for the day before she goes out? 
that peak peak flow meter so we're using what zone thing what are we using how do we how does she know which area she's in and what to do that little color yeah. that red yellow green zone thing right are you seeing where this comes in, into place? So that's more of a home care. The peak flow is usually more of a home care management to know where they're at. So that way they, it empowers them to be at home. They don't have to come to the hospital or go to the, um, the, the clinic or go into their doctor's offices frequently. All right. So, all right. One more, or do you guys want to do the other activity? The escape room. One more. One more. So this is the only other one, this last one. Okay. So let's do one more. So here is the scene. This is actually one of our Speed and World Championship teams back in 2017. This is a, one of our national championship teams. You might see some of these people at the hospital. All right, here's the deal. You're an RRT uh, and you're also an RPFT. Congratulations. Registered Pulmonary Function Technologist working in outpatient pulmonary function lab. You are assigned a Pima student to help you out today. I see excitement. Right? You're like, I don't want to be a preceptor. It will happen so quickly. Right? All right. You have scheduled to do a, P a complete PFT that day. You begin the day by calibrating the pneumotechometer and asking the student how this is done. They reply that you do this using a three liter. Three liter super syringe at. Three different flow rate. Right? Yes, that's actually a speedable question that these guys missed at nationals. I was so furious. All right, don't miss that at nationals. I'm like, how dare you? Right, three three in a syringe, three different flow rates. All right, the patient is suspected of having obstructive disease. What test would uh, help compare to the force vital capacity maneuver for this type of patient? The SBC. There you go. All right, they reply and say that we should perform a slow vital capacity to obtain accurate expiratory volumes. That's a great student. <laughs> These are one of our other students that also played speed ball. He's, I have a bias towards speed ballers. All right, you then ask a student the technique to perform a slow vital capacity. They replied there needs to be? Three to four good breaths. Good, what type of breaths? Normal. By normal, you mean, what's the fancy word we call it? Tidal volume. Tidal volume, Tidal volume breaths with a maximal inhale and a maximal slow and complete exhale. The student further states that the VC tests are acceptable if the volumes are within? 10. 150 ml. 150 milliliters or 5% of each other. You then ask the student the technique for performing a forced vital maneuver, and they replied they need to, what do they need to do first? Inhale. Inhale maximally and exhale. Quick. Fast. Fast, right? Until they're all the way out. The student further states the forced vital capacity looks at? Both volumes and both flow volumes and flow rates. This is an awesome interaction you're having with this student. The student states that what type of volumes? Low. Low volumes indicate. Restrictive. Restrictive pathology and low flow rates indicate obstructive. obstructive pathology, right? You ask a normal pulmonary function values are determined. They replied, that, hey, there's three factors that go into determining this. It is how do we predict normal? Isn't that height, age, and Sex. Height, age, and sex. Good job. All right, now you get to the actual patient. That's just your interaction with your student. That's a good time. They're well prepared. All right, you have an 81 year old thin frame female show up for her scheduled PFT and baseline AVG. Will I ask you to interpret AVG on this test? 
Yes. All right. So go take a peek at that because that's part of PFT. That's part of diagnostics world is interpreting outpatient PFTs as well. She denies all the contraindications. She denies any recent pulmonary infections. This is good. She denies any known heart issues or swollen extremities. Swollen extremities is usually a sign of like heart failure, um, things like that. All right. She's being evaluated for disability uh, and get it, uh, after getting a diagnosis of IPF. What's IPF? Does anyone know? Take a guess. You haven't had disease class yet, so take a guess. F stands for fibrosis. P is pulmonary fibrosis. Interstitial or idiopathic. <laughs> idiopathic maybe? Yeah, so this is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So pulmonary fibrosis, does that sound like an obstructive pathology or restrictive pathology? It's a restrictive? Restrictive, right? That's the tissue getting restricted in. It's sort of having that high elasticity part to it. She is 162 centimeters tall. How tall is she in inches? Five four. Five four. Five four. What? You guys are rocking this. Okay. Well, uh, vital signs. What do you notice? Anything uh, sticking out? The respiratory rate kind of high. Yeah. Is does blood pressure is low. Yeah, blood pressure is low, and that could be a, a healthy blood pressure, too, for some people. Um, with a re high respiratory rate, if you go back to pulmonary MP, I know it was a while ago, but if you go back to there, we talked about how with l high elasticity, with the lung compliance being low, what does your lungs do? What does your body do to compensate for not being able to breathe deep? If you can't breathe deep, you're, it's going to tell your brain stem to breathe. Faster. Faster. Faster to compensate. So that baseline respiratory rate, that's also a sign of low compliance, right? All right, diagnostic ABG, what's the interpretation? Would be metabolic alkalosis with corrected hypoxia. So let's go through this. Chronic respiratory acidosis with normal oh. hypoxia or normal O2. Would it be mild hypoxemia? So PO2 of 50 in the That's 50s. The CO2 though. The O2 oh, sorry. A PO2 in the 70s. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> That would make it mild. Miles, right? So a seven three six is with the normal limits, right? So that this is either a compensated or a perfect blood gas. Well, with their CO two being fifty, we know it's not a perfect blood gas. So this is a compensated acidosis, right? Because it leans towards the acidic side. So it's a compensated acidosis. Respiratory is to blame for that. So this is a compensated respiratory acidosis. The bicarb is in a basic side, right? So that's why it's a compensated respiratory acidosis. And it's on room air with mild hypoxemia. So 94% on room air. It's really pretty good uh, for Colorado, especially if she was in Colorado. All right, here's her diagnostic PFT. You do a DLCO on her, right? That's not the first test you do, but I'm just giving you some front, front information here. Uh, DLCO is 18 mLs per minute per millimeter mercury. Normal? It's low. Low. Interesting. 
All right, spontaneous lung compliance study, which we can do this in the PFT lab without you being on the ventilator. It's an esophageal balloon. We look at the, the pleural pressure by looking at your esophageal pressure. It's pretty cool. So we can see the change of pressure with the change of volume, which then we can calculate compliance. Um, spontaneous lung compliance is at 40 mLs per centimeter water. That's low. Low, so restrictive. Interesting, which we already sort of knew with her IPF, right? Uh, her raw is one and a half centimeters water per liter per second. Miranda says low or normal. Is that what normal. you said? Normal, yeah. yeah. All right, tell me the interpretation of her PFT. I know I'm giving you everything here. That's her how the real, what's that? Her slow vital is low. Okay, so volume's low so far. Force vital? Low. Low, so volume's low there too. Uh, FEV1 to FBC, also known as the FEV1%, is? The normal. Normal, 25 to 75? That norm. Normal, right? Uh, 200 to 1200, also flow rate. Normal. Normal. Do you really need to move on? Okay, I'm just trying to help you out, okay? You can look through the whole report and it's a good thing, good practice to do that. I just want you to see, I looked at major volumes, I looked at major flow rates, and now I can get a general idea of where her lung function is. So where is her lung function overall? Normal range. Low volume. Low volume, which would indicate? Restrictive. Restrictive pathology. Now it's restrictive and she has a low DLCO. So this comes back to that flow chart. Restrictive and a low DLCO. So is this a chest wall abdominal disorder that's restricting her like what we see with Jagger with, with being restricted by the pleural effusion? Or is this an actual lung tissue problem? Lung tissue. Lung tissue. Yeah. Do you guys see where we're going at here? Is this somewhat helpful? Yeah. Right. The more you practice these patterns, the better it's going to be. And then if you go back down here and look at all her volumes, her IRV, her ERV, her residual volume, her inspiratory capacity, FRC, her total lung capacity, her residual volume to total lung capacity, um, all these things are low. Residual volume to total lung capacity, that's low because if her lungs are stiff, can she have a lot of residual volume that stays in there? No, right? If her, her, her residual volume compared to her total lung capacity is going to be low, that's why that looks like a normal number. It's actually an increase because her lungs are so stiff. Don't worry about that one. If that one confuses you, don't look at it yet. You're not there yet, right? So you don't have to look at that value. So what are we looking at here? Restrictive, obstructive, combined? Restrictive. Restrictive. And so her whole thing that we were looking at was to see if she qualified for disability, right? So we sort of knew what to do going in, what to expect going in. Uh, would this condition cause it difficulty to inhale or exhale? Inhale. Inhale, right? It's restrictive, it's inhale issue. If it's obstructive, it's exhale issue. And if you have a combined condition, you got both going on. Right. That's why I would always ask them my basic patient assessment. Hey, are you having trouble breathing in, breathing out, or sort of both? And so that would help me as the RT at the bedside, just sort of see what I'm dealing with, right? Where I can focus my energies. All right. Her lung compliance was? Low. Low, right? That fits along with restrictive. Her raw was? Normal. Normal, which would go along more with obstructive pathology. Her lung volumes were? Low. Low. Her flow rates were? Normal. Normal, right? Seeing the pattern here. Her DLCO was? Low. Low, which means it is easy or hard? Hard. Hard for oxygen to get into her bloodstream, right? It's looking at how hard it is to get oxygen to the bloodstream. Could giving her some supplemental oxygen help her? Did she have hypoxemia on her blood gas? Yeah, she had mild. 
So could she be a good candidate for supplemental oxygen therapy? Absolutely. What? All right. Here's the scenario. It's a little bit of ethics. We're recording the test. You send it to the pulmonologist. To interpret, you receive a call from the doctor. They ask you to adjust her height for a few inches taller and then recalculate her values. She told the physician she was 5'7", and this change would help her qualify for disability. What are you going to do? So if we tell if we tell the machine she is taller than what we recorded, then it makes her numbers look even smaller. Then that would qualify her for disability. You what are you going to do? It's fraud. <laughs> it's fraud. But what are you going to do? Are you just going to say I? I what What's going to be your actual words? Like how would you actually respond here? That's. I would say no because that's not what her height is. And if they say, I want you to do it anyway. Can you retake her height and then tell the physician? Now with me, does it sound like I have this exact scenario? Yeah. Um, so I want to prepare you, right? I'd rather have you think about this now than then. Does that make sense, right? A little bit of extra, right? A little extra here in, in diagnostics class, but when I took, when we get a patient to the PFT lab, I would weigh and measure them right there, right? We have the scale that has the height thing on it. So I would weigh and measure them that day, right? So I don't just go by what their driver's license says or what they say they are. Um, I go by what I actually have measured. Um, so this is the question now is how are you going to respond, right? I want you to think about this now. What is ethically appropriate? What is best overall way to do this, right? How would you respond? All right. And if you refuse to change the numbers, then they start calling you an uneducated tech. Happened to me, right? How would you respond to that? They went to an emotional place, right? Understand they just went to an attack. They went to an emotional place. How are you going to respond? What are you going to say? What's going to be your plan? What are you going to do? Wouldn't you need to get like your supervisor involved? Uh, it's not a bad idea to let them know that this situation's happening, but this is you're on the phone with them and you're having this discussion. We could call it that, I guess. Uh, you're having that discussion. So are you just going to hang up on them and then call your supervisor and just hope they, right? Is that? Um, when I was like an MA and I had to do disability paperwork for cardiac patients, when they ask for stuff like that, I just kind of um, clarify, like, I'm, I cannot do that. That's illegal and it's lying on medical documentation, which is something I won't do. And then if they start attacking or getting defensive. I just saw them like, um, I'm not going to allow you to talk to me like that. I can give you a couple seconds to calm down or I'm not going to kiss you any further and I can get you a supervisor. But that's kind of how they told us to handle it. Like you try to talk to them and if they're still rude to you and stuff, like you don't have to take that. Like reassure them that they're still going to be help and they're still going to get help, but just not from me because you're not treating them. Yeah, don't let it go into your heart. Don't let you go to that place too. Don't respond in that type of way. Does that make sense? Right? Because you're going to, you'll never regret gonna, you having a positive response to that. Go ahead. I was just going to say, it's just always better to just not engage. Like don't, don't respond the same way they responded to you. Always stay like in an unemotional place when they start getting emotional towards you. Yeah, in this case, I knew this physician well, uh, and I knew that she was just in a stressful place, right? And I knew that she just got done with the code like two hours before, right? I knew exactly what was going on in her because I was at that code with her, right? And then I went down to the PFT lab to do the PFT. Um, so I knew that that was the case. I knew she was in a hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? The halt space, right? And so I knew she was just 
in a bad space right now and she was where she was. And so it's like, I just got to understand, do I want to engage with that? Like what Chris saying, or do I want to sort of just respond in kind and be like, so this is what I have and this is how I directly measured it. Um, but if you want to talk about this further, we can talk about that. But at this point, um, uh, we can schedule that meeting, but at this point, uh, I need to move on type thing, right? <laughs> get them, let them get out of that space. Cause in that current space of attack mode, are you going to get a lot accomplished? Right. That's the question there, right? Go get her a Snickers bar, right? Help her through, right? So some just gentle tips here, right? So these are some things that I've learned over my career. You can take these or not, right? These are your options, right? Decide how you're going to respond now uh, before when you find that difficult situation. When a trach patient says, you weren't suctioning me deep enough, and I don't believe in crying and stabbing, and then he's angry, but he's in pain, right? He's in back pain. He's in so on and so forth pain. It's the pain that's controlling their brain, and that brain is not in a good, calm state right? How are you going to take it to heart, right? Is this situation, in this situation, should you halt, right? Not only are you thinking about, is that other person hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? But also, are you in a position where you should halt? Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired, right? Or is something going on with you that day? Because does life happen to us as providers too? Right. You could just get done seeing a kid die in front of you and move, have to move on to the next patient, the next patient. Right. So could there be a situation where you should halt with these types of interactions where you could accidentally take it out on other people? Absolutely. So you should take a moment. You need that self assessment to be like, should I halt right now? Right. Should I stop? and correct myself. Should I stop and take a moment to regather my thoughts, to regather my emotions, name my emotions, have a plan to address them and then adjust, right? Do you guys sort of see where I'm going at here? Right. So it's not just other providers, but it's also yourself. So have a plan in place, right? So you need that. There's a saying that goes, hurt people hurt people, right? So when you're under attack or when you're hurt, there's odds are you could be the one attacking if you're the one that's hurt. So if someone attacks you and hurts you, what could be your response? You, you're now hurt. Could you now attack others, right? So understand if that happens, you need to have that introspection time. I know fancy word, have that introspection and understand where you're at and what you're gonna do with it, right? I know this is extra bonus material, but I wanna make sure you got this. Uh, prepare for the extras that are out there, not just the academics, right? Remember, everybody, no matter who you are, have their own uh, agendas, vendettas, uh, but the patient's got to be the priority here. So in this situation, does this patient really qualify? Well, according to my scale, according to my uh, uh, height on my scale and all that stuff, she didn't meet those qualifications, right? So the patient's the big primary focus. So that's another Thing to bring the conversation back to because did they take it from I want that you to adjust their numbers and you're an uneducated tech well let's take it back to the patient as the focus all right so I measured her at this uh, I don't know what your records are but you can come and verify my scale or you know you can measure her at your office as well but this is how I measured her with our scale here so remember patient focus has got to be the big thing here Right. If they take it to a personal level, the great way to diffuse that in the moment is actually taking it back to the patient focus. Does that make sense? It's a little diffusing thing. Right. Someone, uh, I remember a nurse, there was a tube that slipped out on a kid in our pediatric ICU. And so the kid was, the cord, the, it went above the vocal cords, the ET tube went above the vocal cords. And so the nurse was just like, who taped this tube and so on and so forth. She was angry at the previous RT or whatever. And I'm like, hey, that's not the focus. Let's go ahead and focus on untaping it and advancing it back in and we'll resecure it. And then we'll talk about that later. And that was in the moment, right? That was when we we're trying to save this kid, get this two back into the kid's airway, right? So let's focus on this and then we'll worry about the rest of it in a little bit here. So it's a great little way to diffuse that moment. And that took her out of her anger mindset towards whoever taped the two previously. And it took her towards, okay, let's focus on this and then we'll deal with the rest later. Does that make sense? Right. So I'm not getting rid of it. I'm just saying, hey, let's focus on this for now and then we'll focus on the rest later. All right. So communication, direct, distinct, polite, but focus, um, keep the patient in focus with that whole context. Right. 
Uh, don't take it personally, right? Sometimes, like I said, hurt people, hurt people. So if that doctor had their blood sugar low earlier from doing a code and using their mental energy to fix that code, they could be under that circumstance. They could be a little bit more curt than usual. So uh, maybe we have a more consistent interaction later, right? Outside the care of the patient. Let's talk about this later on, right? So you never know what perceptions are out there. So uh, if someone approaches you about this, then listen, listen to them. If someone approaches you um, as a provider and says, you know, I'm feeling hurt the way you talk to me, the way you interacted, take that as a moment, not of being attacked, but just as that their perception of you in a moment during a code or during an interaction, take that with, with that, that opportunity to grow right? If that's the perception that they got from you. So don't ever do that. I still take those opportunities. People are like, hey, this is how you came off here. I want to know, right? I want to grow through that scenario. So some keys really quick. Uh, don't let our feelings overrule your ability to provide care, right? So it's okay to have those feelings, but just focus on the patient for the meantime, and we can focus on the rest, right? Justin actually once said, I quoted him here, right? Justin actually once said, we must own that we get offended from previous experiences. So that's our own personal vendettas, biases that all of us bring to every daily interaction we do, right? What happened to us in the childhood, we still bring with us to adulthood, right? So this means that your interactions, right, and with others and with you can be impacted by your histories and their histories and impact how they interact with you. So it's not always just about you, how people treat you. Sometimes it's people bringing their own things into it as well. So just understand that, give you some perspective, right? So hopefully you don't down yourself or talk yourself down too much about these type of things, right? So find a way to deal with them in a healthy manner, right? These feelings, you still need to deal with them. You can't just hide them under a rug somewhere, right? You got to find a way to deal with them. And we talked about this in first semester. I think it was Lucas that brought that up in first semester a while ago. How are you going to deal with these emotions? When you see a kid died, when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired at the hospital, what are you going to deal? How are you going to continue to interact? How are you going to continue to take care of your patients? What's going to be your plan, right? And so I want to want you guys to think about how you're going to develop that, right? So don't... Uh, so look at the I and the you statements that you have. Don't say you make me feel worthless when you're talking to these people. Say I feel worthless when I'm spoken to that way, right? So that's a way that it avoids the attack in the moment, right? So always use those you words instead of I words, right? All right, I'm sorry. Don't use the you words, use the I words. I feel this way when this type of situation happens, right? So that's the big thing there. Now, thoughts on this. I wanted to make sure to talk about this because this really did happen to me, right? You're an uneducated tech, so on and so forth, right? And I had just got published when that happened, which was kind of funny. But what are your thoughts about this? What are, what are your plans, right? Some of you said that um, Chriselle was sharing, like, hey, let's focus on this. I don't need to be talked to this way. Maybe we can talk at a later time. What are some other thoughts you have? I think it's important to just like stand your ground and not like budge at all, like it not give up any ground, you know. Um, I deal with people like that a lot at work. I mean, it's, it's different working in a restaurant compared to a hospital setting, but people get that way sometimes and you just have to be like, look, man, this is the way it is and I don't want to get in trouble, you know. Sometimes I also kind of joke with them, like, I was like, hey, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Nah, I need to be something. If I joke with them sometimes, they're just like, oh, okay, like you're right. Or just like kind of um, focusing their attention on something else or changing the subject. So, sometimes letting them vent about it too kind of helps them too. Um, once they start venting about their frustration, they kind of like realize that they're taking it out on you and they're just like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And I'm like, no, it's all good. But you really can't take it personal or it just makes that whole environment really hostile. It's not fun cutting off drunk people too. <laughs> At least in like the restaurant, they're all drunk and not reasonable. And yeah, it's just trying to like even joke around with them just to kind of get on their level, you know, just be like, Hey man, I know you're out having fun. I would be too if I wasn't here, but you know, I got a responsibility to take care of. 
just kind of try and get on their level and yeah, joking around kind of helps too. I was going to say, Christelle, definitely letting them kind of just get their emotions out. When COVID first happened, I had like an 80 year old man who had to like follow up with every single day at the health department. First day I called him, he bitched me out for like a half hour, swore at me, everything, but I had to call him every day to follow up with his, you know, his healthcare. And then after that, every single day, he was so happy to talk to me, would like want to continue talking to me. I'm like, I got to call like 50 other people to check in on them. So it's just sometimes like that first get their emotions out and then they can usually get their composure and calm down. And then it's usually okay after that. A lot of the time when they feel like they feel like they can vent to you or just like you won't take it personal, the more they tell you and the more comfortable they are and then you can provide better care. All right, so hopefully you're thinking a little bit about how you're going to approach this. What if you have a preceptor? The other thing I, I'm just opening up to you because this happened recently. What if a preceptor blames you for things that they did? How are you going to respond? Right, so I just want... I just want you guys to start thinking about this, right? This is a little extra, right? I know I'm taking up a little bit of your time, but I want you to think about this because I want you prepared not only academically, but emotionally for what you're about to see and go through and potentially, right? I'm not saying a preceptor will do this to you, but what happens if that goes down? How are you going to respond? What's your, what's your game plan, right? What's your, how are you going to feel? How are you going to interact? What are you going to say? Right. So I just want to start preparing you mentally and emotionally for that type of situation. I'm not saying that will happen, but I'm saying if it does, what's your game plan? Something to think through now when you don't have emotions running through your veins compared to when that actually happens and you don't have a game plan and it's running through your veins, you're more likely to make some mistakes. I'm just saying we're all human, right? That we're more likely to say things if we don't have that game plan ahead of time. I will say if a preceptor did that to me, I would feel like that would be a little harder to deal with because we're still learning. And then also we're, we're a representation for the school. So you don't want to say something that makes you look so rude and just a disrespectful person. Yeah, in that situation, I would probably Is say like- okay to ask them? Never mind. It's a, we want to hear what you have to say. Oh, the internet. Okay. Like I would probably maybe say, hey, can we have, you know, a private conversation later and, you know, talk to them, see if something's going on with them, or, you know, that that's what they're doing. But, you know, kind of like Terry said, you know, kind of explain to them, hey, like, you know, this is affecting me. We kind of need to get back on the same page for things. You know, I'm still learning. Sometimes when it comes to stuff like that, because there's even doctors sometimes who are wrong, um, you just gotta kind of fight it sometimes. Sometimes you just take it and you're like, oh, well, can you show me the right way to do it? Like, sometimes you just gotta make them feel like they're right because <laughs> the argument's not worth it. There's been a couple doctors who were wrong, but I'm not gonna argue. So I'm just like, oh, well, like, what's the right way? And then they're not even as defensive anymore because they're like, oh, they want help. I'll show you. And then they're better than it go. But that's a really hard, really hard one to not get rude with. Yeah, that's why I'm like, come up with a game plan now. Right, when you don't have those emotions going through you, practice it just like practicing coaching a PFT. Right, come up with the game plan now. Yeah, so that's happened, right? That happened recently. Our well, there was a preceptor out there blaming one of our students about on things she did, uh, and I sort of believe that situation. So, uh, how are you going to respond? What are your what, what are your, I know what you're going to be feeling, right? But how are you going to respond in that moment? And then how are you going to deal with those emotions that are running through your veins at that time later on, 
right? Because that's going to cause you a little bit of anger, a little bit anxious, a little bit of upsetness, right? That's going to be going on with that. How are you going to deal with that at home? The student did respond very well. She responded very, very well. I was very proud of her, right? I got to let her know that, right? And she could tell us those things because I want to know those things. I want to help you through this. I want to give you positive reinforcement. Or if you're having trouble with it, then I want to help you as much as I can. Um, but uh, I was glad that she was open enough to tell us, the, the professors, like she was open enough to tell us about that situation so we can help her through that um, overall. What did you guys do? uh in regards to that situation so we have uh, a lot of us have very good contacts at these different facilities um and then a lot of us know these educators and managers at these different facilities pretty well um and so there are avenues that we can take to sort of um just verify with the care team at those facilities that um this is the response that we're getting from students for preceptors because we do want to protect our students. Like that is a primary goal. We don't just throw you out there to get whipped, right? That's not the whole deal. That's not our MO. Um, so if there's something like that going on, we need to know about it. If there's a, a therapist endangering a patient, we need to know about it, right? Um, so then we can approach it from the educational, a, a, a gentle educational standpoint. And if it's a pattern that, that that we're seeing from students and then we make the facility aware of that pattern, then that could actually help resolve that situation and protect patients. Because I still care about patients out there, even though I'm not out in patient care anymore. I mean, I'm sorry, but that patient still comes first to me. Like what Justin was telling you guys when you first came into the program. Uh, if I catch someone cheating in one of my classes, you're hurting the patient down the road because you don't know your ethics are screwed up and you're going to end up being one of those ghost people that just chart treatments that you didn't do and chart vet checks that you didn't do. And I'm protecting the patients by doing that. Right. And same thing with out there. If you see someone that has a pattern in that, let us know because we want to protect those patients. It's my profession that you're talking about there. So do I want to protect those patients and do I want to protect the future of this profession? A hundred percent. So I was glad that she was open to us about that. But yeah, we can let those educators uh, at those facilities or managers at those facilities uh, look for certain patterns with those therapists, which they can sniff out pretty easily um, to help correct that. And then there are certain facilities. If the environment's very hostile to students, we'll pull our students from going to that facility. Straightforward. You don't need that. Right? You don't need to see a toxic environment. You don't need to see that type of thing going on. It's not good for you. It's not good for the profession. So we care about you and we care about those patients. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Sort of. Okay. All right, real quick, I do want to make sure we do the escape room today to make sure to practice for Thursday. So we'll start that and I'll just snake through the uh, attendance list. So hopefully it's one student by one student. So, oh, sorry, I was going to read Lucas's chat. Um, uh, Lucas said, okay, in this case, it's okay to ask them, please show me where I went wrong because I'm still learning. That's a good way of doing it. It's a good way of being like, okay, show me how you would do it, even though you know they're the one that sort of did that, right? Um, that's, a not a, that's not a bad way to do it at all. Right. That's a good way to be like, okay, show me how you were taught or show me how and what, how did you approach it that way? I remember having a, a patient, uh, they were doing a bedside uh, inhale corticosteroid. So uh, a flow vent inhaler. And usually you're, for MDIs, you're supposed to use a spacer, right? Whenever you do an inhaler, you're supposed to use a spacer to do it. So the, the, RT, the RTs before me kept making this patient use the spacer because that was our policy. If you're using an a, a MDI, you're using a spacer. And so he's like, no, the doctor ordered me not to use that. And so I was the first one to ask him, and I was surprised by this, why did the doctor order you not to use the spacer? He's like, because I get those things in the back of my throat where it's inflamed and swollen. And that's what he wants me to put the medicine on is the back of my throat with the inhaler, the inhaled corticosteroid. So does it make sense for him to use a spacer? No, it actually makes sense to order him not to use it. So I was like, well, then let's do it the way the doctor ordered it. 
Does that make sense? Like little things like that, where you're just asking questions. Like if a doctor says, okay, I want to do, instead of a time volume of six mLs per kilo, I want to put them on 15 mLs per kilo. You're going to be like, that's more than double what it should be. That's dangerous. And then you realize, why is he doing that? So what are your thoughts behind that, right? So this is a, a good statement. What are your thoughts behind that? I'll repeat that again. What are your thoughts behind that? You know, so it looks like I'm wanting to learn. And I did. And he's like, hey, this is a spinal cord injury patient, right? Their lung compliance is going to be amazing. Their chest wall compliance going to be amazing. And we need those higher tidal lines because they're more prone to infections if they don't have larger tidal lines, more of a Craig spinal cord injury type patient. So I was like, oh, I just learned something, right? That I never knew. Now I'm a better provider for knowing it. So when I see a spinal cord injury patient walk in, am I better equipped to take care of them now? Absolutely. Because I took that growth base. I'm like, hey, what are your thoughts behind that mindset versus like, hey, I learned six mLs per kilo and that's all I'm ever going to do. Right type mindset. Does that make sense? Right. What are your thoughts behind that? Right. Not a bad way to go. All right. So we're going to go. If you go into your, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, I'll try to go through the list. If you're not, if you don't respond, that's okay. Uh, but this is just sort of a fun exercise to see if you guys got, um, got the content down for Thursday. Um, but if you need to leave, I understand, but I want to make sure you got the content down, but hopefully uh, you enjoy a little bit of fun here with the information. So if you go to your, go ahead. Uh, is this kind of a overview of what's on the exam? Not I overview, but like, yeah. Okay. Never mind. I can't officially answer that. Okay. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying by saying that. Yeah. Sorry. All right. <laughs> like I can officially answer that. So here's the thing. I'll just go through person to person. I think we'll start with Ashley and then uh, we'll go through. And then if you can answer it, great. Uh, if you don't or get the question wrong, we'll move to a penalty slide, which is just another question from somewhere, uh, somewhere else in the respiratory field. So Nothing big there. No worries. The whole thing is like, do you know it or not? That's okay. If you want to ask for help with one of the other students, that's okay too. Um, that's perfectly fine. So if you're like, hey, uh, Kara, I need some help with this question. What are your thoughts on it? That's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. All right. So the respiratory PFT escape room, right? Uh, so you just need to correctly answer the question. If you get one wrong, then you'll get a subsequent some would say difficult, but it's out of one of the other RT things that we've talked about. You'll have about 10 seconds to answer the question. So pretty straightforward. All right, first question, Ashley, are you ready? You there? Unmute. You might want to unmute for this whole thing. Let's see, Ashley, are you there? No. All right, Natalie, are you there? Feels a weird. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. You get the first one. All I right. Interpret Natalie, this. So it's okay. What's that? I said I, res I respond to Natalie too. So oh yeah. My it. bad. No, it's okay. My handwriting is unique. All right. So interpret this PFT. These are all percents of predicted. So the SVC looks normal. Um, the FVC looks a little bit low. Um, and the FEV 1% uh, is also low. Um, so with the FEV 1% being low, that could be indicative of a flow rate issue. Um, but the FVC is also low. So would this be like a combined? Oh, yeah, but the SVC is normal. Never mind. So yeah, it's um, or obstructive because of the low there you flow go. rate. Perfect. Obstructive pathology. Was that super bad? No, I just had okay. to remember that the SVC was normal. <laughs> yeah, those tricky air trappers, they'll get you. All right, Jason, you ready? Yep. All right, name three contraindications for performing a PFT. Uh, pneumothorax, hemoptysis, and uh, recent or dementia. Dementia, that's, that's good. Or re, I was going to say recent uh, eye exam or surgery, retinal surgery. 
Well, eye surgery or cataract Dilation. removal. Yeah. Cataract removal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but eye surgery would count too. Um, all right, Daniel, are you ready? You there? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Name the four lung volumes. Your volume capacity box might be useful. You can always ask for help if you need it. You don't have to. Okay, I'm gonna ask for it then. <laughs> All right, pick your person. Uh, expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume. Um, reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume you already said the erv oh inspiratory reserve volume. irv i almost got to the penalty slides there all right good job <laughs> all right teamwork all right carrie you ready no you are you're totally ready i picked alphabetical order so if you're like derek's picking on people i am in alphabetical order all right all right how is the pneumotac calibrated um, you have to do the syringe with the three liters and you have to do it three different volumes or flow rates. There you go. Because the volume's known, right? It's a three liter syringe. Fast, yeah. slow, medium, fast, right? Good job. Feeling good? Is this fun? Sort of? No? Okay. All right. Uh, Karen, you there? She's not here today. She's not here. All right. Uh, Anthony, do you go by Anthony or Tony? Oh, yeah, Anthony's fine. What's that? Anthony's fine? Yeah. Okay. All right. You ready? Yep. All right. Name three things that would cause a decrease in FEV1%. Could be a disease, could be other things. Um. Is it emphysema is one? Um, that's the only one I can think of. Honest. Are there other diseases besides emphysema that would cause low flow rates? Right, so asthma. Asthma. That's two. Asthma and emphysema. Um, with cystic fibrosis. There you go. Cystic fibrosis is another one. Good job. And then there's the other things too, like aspirating a foreign object and yeah, other stuff, lung tumors. Good job. All right. Um, Lauren, you ready? Yes. All right. Name all the lung capacities. Um, we got total lung capacity, vital capacity, um forced vital capacity and then slow vital or no inspiratory capacity I there you go i see frc vital capacity and tlc not particularly in that order those are just what came to mind good job you got it all right lucas you ready He says yes. Okay. All right. What is the normal value for the DLCO? Response. Do you put it in the chat? Um, are you sure about that answer is what I'm going to ask you. No. Did you want to ask a friend? 
Do you ask care for help? Twenty five milliliters. Is what did what did you say? The twenty five milliliters of CO per minute per um, millimeters of mercury. Correct. That's a board exam question. So that's something. Just be very confident with that one. That one or comfortable with that one. Good job. All right, Johnny, you there? Yes. All right. Here is your question. A stable what is important for a slow vital capacity maneuver? I'm going to ask Miranda for help. Miranda? Yes. Tidal volume? There you go. A stable tidal volume is important for the slow model capacity. Good job. You guys haven't had to use any penalty slides yet. I'm feeling self-conscious. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, Johnny, Clive is the next one. Are you ready, Clive? Yep. All right. Which specific PFT value would best evaluate for obstructive lung disease? Hint. It's taken from the force vital maneuver. It's the best one for obstructive lung disease. So you're saying it's not the FVC? It's taken from the FVC maneuver. What specific value in the FVC maneuver is perfect for looking at obstructive diseases? It's the best one for obstructive diseases. It's the FVC, the 1%? Yeah, the FEV 1%. Good job. All right, Miranda, you ready for your question? Yep. All right. What is a PD20 and what PFT procedure does it come from? This one's not easy. We might have to go to a penalty slide. I'm going to ask for help. <laughs> okay, who are you going to ask? Uh, Natalia. Isn't like the PD20, like, isn't it done like after like a methacholine challenge? So that's and the procedure. Like, um, like, if it's like decreased by like a 20, is it 20% of like FEV1? Yep. Yeah, if the FEV1 by, drops by 20%, so it's the dose, provocative dose is what it stands for. That's it, yeah. So that's the dose or the concentration it takes to drop their FEV1 by 20%. So the lower the concentration or the lower the dose, the more sensitive their airways are. Good job. Oh. I thought I was going to get a penalty slide out of that one. Darn what it. Was the, what was the dose of again? The methacholine is the most commonly used one. There are other ways to do it. Methacholine is just the most common um, way to do the methacholine, the, the bronchoprovocation. All right, so that was Miranda. Ryan, you there? Ryan? No? Claire? I should take attendance this way. No, I'm just joking. Uh, Claire, are you there? No? All right, that means Elle's next. Oh, Claire said her mic isn't working. Oh, okay. Does she want to use the chat? We can do the chat. Do you want to use the chat, Claire? 
Okay, sure. All right. So let's do that. All right, Claire, this is your question. How do you evaluate for effort with the MVV test? How do we know they gave us a good effort? You can always ask for help if you need it. <laughs> Kara? <laughs> uh, would that be the same as the test acceptability? So like the two tests have to be within 10% of each other? So that would be reproducibility, but how do you find efforts? There's a certain calculation. Should she pass it off to somebody? Is it uh, the FEV one times the 35? There you go. That way you see if they got good effort on their MVV. Or if, well, well, I'll stop there. Good job. But that was almost a penalty slide. Good job. All right, Michelle or Elle, are you there? Yeah. All right. Your question, should you accept it? What does the FEF 200 to 1200 evaluate? Uh, does that uh, do the airflow in the upper airways or the larger airways? Perfect. Yep, large airways. So like tracheomalacia, tumors, things like that. Um, Kelly, are you there? Good job. Kelly, is she there? No? Yes. He's in the chat. Okay. All right. All right. So, question. You ready? What is the concentration of carbon monoxide in the DLCO gas? It's a board question. Point three percent. Good job. Point three percent. Good job. All right, Andrea, you ready? Yes. Yes. You're fine. It's all about having fun. If the DLCO is normal and volumes are low, what process is the issue? So DLCO is low and volumes are also low. Is it obstructive? So the volumes are low. Restrictive. Okay, so it's restrictive, but the DLCO is also low. What's causing the restriction? Is it chest wall, abdomen, or is it tissue, lung tissue? Um, you can ask for help too if you want. Okay, um, I'll ask Kara. <laughs> what are we, chest wall and neuromuscular disorders? If the DLCO is low or if the DLCO is normal, sorry. The DLCO is normal and the volume's low, you're saying it's neuromuscular chest wall? The DLCO is normal. And volumes are low. I'm not telling you to rethink it. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to clarify what you said. That's all. Right? I'm not trying to influence you. I promise. Right? Oh, that would be like an IDL. So the okay. DLCO is, no, I am trying to make you rethink it now. The, ILD, the DLCO is normal. 
normal DLCO. Good diffusion. Good diffusion, but volumes are low. You Good got me all confused. <laughs> no, I you had it right the first time, but I don't know what I was just trying trying to clarify what I heard. That's all. Yeah, I was it would be chest wall. <laughs> Yeah, chest wall or abdominal, right? <laughs> you had it right. I just I could, didn't hear it right, right? I have man syndrome. It happens. Okay. <laughs> Good job. All right. Um, Annette, you ready? Sure. Okay. True or false? You get a true or false. A severe restrictive process may make a patient take up to 15 seconds to completely exhale. Restrictive process. Uh, false. False. Why is it false? Because the restrictive is on your intake of air, would cause a complication there. So what? What's the big thing here? What would this statement? What would make this statement true if you replaced restrictive with obstructive? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Chriselle, you there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. What does the DLCO evaluate? Mm -hmm. It evaluates the diffusing capacity of the lung tissue. All right. But what does that mean to me if I don't have a pulmonary background? So the gas exchange between the lungs. And? Blood. Yeah, there you go. How easy or hard it is to, for oxygen to get into the bloodstream. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> All right, Alyssa, you're right. Good job. Yeah. Okay. Name three ways to obtain a residual volume. Three ways to get a residual volume on a patient. Don't let this question put you in a box. Is that like the equipment? Yeah, there's three ways to see to, oh, to go ahead. That, that the pneumotachometer? Well, that's just uh, something that will read flow rates and volumes. Okay. But one of three ways I can get someone's residual volume. Mm This question can wash out some things, can dilute some things, can box some things. That doesn't help me. Is that the, the body box? Right, body box, so body plus myography. Three ways? Um, you got one of them. Gosh, I don't know the other two. You can always ask for help if you need it. I don't know who to ask though. Everyone's like already been asked. <laughs> um, I'll ask Miranda again. So it's uh, also, so it's the body box, the nitrogen washout and the helium dilution. Perfect, nitrogen washout or use 100% oxygen. Uh, so body box, nitrogen washouts, and helium dilution are your three ways to obtain residual volume. Sounds like an important question, Derek. It does. Can you go over that again? So there's only three ways to actually get a residual volume because it's the volume you can't exhale. So if I have you do a force vital capacity, it's not going to tell me your residual volume because that's what's in the lungs and you can't exhale it, right? So there's three ways to actually measure it. And that would be doing a body box where we close the door and use Boyle's law, right? 
nitrogen washout, where I give you 100% oxygen, I see how long it takes for you to empty your lungs. So that tells us how much residual volume you have. And then the third way is helium dilution, where we're going to use closed circuit helium, and you're going to breathe it until the helium equilibrates, and it's going to tell us how much total lung capacity or volume you have. And then we can subtract your vital capacity from that. What's left over? Residual volume. So the three ways Important question here. Three ways to obtain residual volume. Body box or body plasmography is the fancy word for body box. Helium dilution and nitrogen washout are your three ways. So if someone's too, uh, their body habitus is such they cannot fit into the body box or they're in a wheelchair or something like that, they can't get into the box, we can do a nitrogen washout is usually what we'll do. But some facilities have helium dilution as well. So depends what your facility has. Eric, really quickly for that question specifically, when we went over it um, on the study guide, the question was for to find the total lung capacity. So is it the same? Precisely, because you you'll you need you can't measure residual volume off of a vital capacity, right? And so that's how we need how we have to find total lung capacity is by knowing what the residual volume is. And once we know what residual volume is, then we know what the total lung capacity is because we already know what the vital capacity is. Now we just need to find out what the RV is. How do we find that? That's how we do it. So that's how you would also find TLC. So the box or nitrogen or helium dilution, one of those three methods. And third way is in theory a CT scan or a chest X-ray. They can do geometry on that as well. Don't need to know that for my purposes. All right. Feeling better about that question? Good one to put in your review for Thursday. All right, so, uh, where are we at? Alyssa Kristen, or Kirsten, is it Kirsten or Kristen? She here? No? Terry? I seen her earlier. Terry, you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, you ready? No. No, you'll be fine. All right, which gas law does the body box exemplify? Uh, Boyle. Boyle, see, you got it. See? That's just perfect. All right, now we cycle. Good job. Uh, now we're going to cycle back up to uh, Natalia. You ready? Yep. All right. How long do we wait in between the DLCO measurements? Um, it's a, isn't it four minutes? Four minutes is correct. Good job. All right, Jason, you ready? Yep. All right. Increased FRC and low flow rates can indicate what type of disorder? Increased FRC and low flow rates. It uh, air trapping. Air trapping happens with what type of primary disorder? Obstructive. There you go. Good job. Air trapping with obstructive. All right, Danielle. Good job. You ready? Yeah. Okay. True or false? You can obtain a total lung capacity by just a force vital capacity maneuver. We just talked about this. True. So you're saying true? No, false. False. Good job. <laughs> right. So we need the body box, heal and dilution, nitrogen washout to get total lung capacity or to find residual volume. So force vital capacity just tells you vital capacity. Good job. All right, Carrie, you ready for uh, your question? <laughs> All right. Oh, you get to interpret this PFT. All right. This is what you'll see on the test. So for everybody that's still watching, this is exactly what you're going to see on the test. 
Like this is how it's going to be. You're going to see all these numbers. You're going to see the observed column, what their predicted was, and then their percent of predicted. All right, so this is exactly the format you're going to see the interpretation on the test. Okay, so this is the exact format you're going to see that. So this is your force vital, slow vital, FEV 1%. So the FEV 1% and the FEC is low. Um, your SVC is still within normal range just within the normal range. Um, so the 28%, that would be um, low, which would lead to a um, because the SVC is within normal, that would um, cancel out that it's a combined, so it would just be an obstructive. Correct. Good job. Did you need to look at every one of those values to figure that out? No. no. Right. This is how the reports look like. You guys seen the reports from me the other day, right? You're going to see all these values. They're only focus on the ones you need to focus on, right? <laughs> Good job. All right, Anthony, you ready? Still yeah. there. Okay. What does it mean if the force vital capacity is larger than the slow vital capacity? If the force is bigger than the slow? Not enough effort by the patient. Would clarify. Uh, it didn't die. I don't know. There's not enough effort on the SVC. Yeah, so they need to redo the slow vital capacity effort. Perfect. Good job. That's actually from the RPFT board exam. That's a direct question. Good job. All right, Lauren, you ready? I'm ready. All right. A patient in pain after abdominal chest wall surgery may have a low what capacity? They just had a surgery on their abdomen. They're not taking deep breaths. I'm gonna say low vital capacity. Perfect. There you go. When we do the I, the IS, the incentive spirometer, right? That's what we're looking at. Is their sort of vital capacity? Have them exhale all the way, and then slow deep breath all the way in. Help improve their vital capacity. Good job. All right, Lucas. You ready? You're in the chat. All right, true or false, peak flow results would only be low in asthma. Only low with asthma, no other condition, just asthma. False, right? There's other conditions like chronic bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, uh, emphysema, right? All those will have a low peak flow, good job. Oh yes, it is also low in asthma. Good job. All right, uh, Johnny, you ready? Yeah. Starting to pick up steam. All right. Interpret this PFT. Observed, predicted, and then percent of predicted. And you can always ask for help if you need it. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to ask for help. Uh, Cara? So the SVC is low. Your uh, FVC, FVC and SVC are both low, but your vital or your FEV 1% is it within normal? So that would be a restrictive. Yep, this is a restrictive pathology. Good job. All right, Clive, you ready? 
Yeah. Right. So don't let this throw you off on the exam, right? This is the format I'm going to use for those. So just don't let that throw you off. All right, Clive, you ready? Mm -hmm. So if the DLCO is low and there is obstructive flow rates, then what kind of process is present? Remember, the DLCO is low and there's obstructive flow rates. Mm -hmm. So it is obstructive? Yep, so there's obstructive flow rates, so low flow rates and low DLCO. So it's obstructive, but what kind of process specifically if the DLCO is also low? Like what disease? Yeah. Uh, COPD? There you go, I'll take it, because emphysema, COPD are used synonymously a lot. So yeah, uh, emphysema slash COPD, perfect. That one wasn't easy. <laughs> Good job. All right, Miranda, you ready? Yep. All right, name all the volumes that make up vital capacity. So it'd be the inspiratory reserve volume the tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. Ah, it's too easy for you. Good job. <laughs> I need to make harder questions. All right, Claire, are you ready? Yes, and it works again. Nice. All right. If the DLCO is normal with low flow rates, this can rule out... I don't know, pass um, by to Miranda this time. Miranda. DLCO is normal with low flow rates. If you like that flow chart that I talked about that one day from Restory Care Journal, that could be helpful here. But what disease does that rule out with normal DLCO and low flow rates. It rules out. Interstitial lung disease. So the flow rates are low, not volumes. Flow rates are low with? Obstructive. Obstructive. And then the DLCO is normal. So is there a disease where only is there a disease where it's going to be low DLCO and low flow rates? What are we ruling out here? If oh, the yeah, so we're ruling out emphysema, right? COPD emphysema. So it's a piggyback on the question Clive had there. So if the DLCO is normal and the flow rates are low, we can rule out COPD emphysema. Then we're looking at asthma, chronic bronchitis, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, right? Then we're looking at one of those. Good job. All right. You ready, Al? You ready? Is she there? <laughs> she in the chat? All right, I'll let you guys go soon. Just a couple more. Are you there? No. Kelly? No? Andrea. I'm here. Okay. All right, Andrea, this is yours. Describe the DLCO breathing technique. Okay. Um, I'm going to try not to look at my notes. So is this the one where you have to make a tight seal around the mouthpiece and breathe hard and fast as fast as you can for 12 seconds? Not quite. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask for help. Okay. From Chriselle. Okay, I'm gonna try to remember the best for my video, but so you're gonna start with normal title reading, to get that established kind of baseline. And then you're gonna have them uh, take a deep breath in. No. And blow out. No? Well, they're no. gonna breathe in, but then they're gonna blow out as hard as they can. Yeah, they and exhale open. completely and then Hold it for 12 seconds, they're inhaling. It, yeah, it. that's when you give them the gases when they're all the way exhaled, and then you give them the gases they inhale in. Oh, okay, okay. That's yeah. what I got backwards on my video too, was the yeah. inhale and the exhale. <laughs> yeah, so they you have them tied while you breathe, four, three to four breaths, and then exhale all the way, and then you give them the gas, right? And then <gasps> inhale, deep breath, hold it for about 10 seconds or eight to 11, according to the board exam, and then exhale. So in the... Um, but the actual equipment is the like the is the gas um, connected to the mouthpiece? Yeah, so you'll so, hook it in line with the box because usually there the box is there. You don't have to close the box for the test, but yeah, you'll do this little circuit that connects the the mixed gas that has the carbon monoxide in it to the mouthpiece. But otherwise, it's not in line with the patient for the other test. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's what I was asking. Right. Okay. You're good. All right, Annette, you ready? Yeah. All right. An increased raw with low flow rates goes along with which disease process in general? Would it be like asthma, bronchitis, or emphysema? Yep. It's going to be those obstructive diseases. Yep. Or obstructive processes. Good job. All right, Chriselle, this is your real question. Interpret this PFT. All right, all right. Um, so predicted's on the far right, percent of predicted, and then FAV 1% is down here. Um, like barely. Mm -hmm. oh, let me see. So the FB, FEV one is a oh, we're starting at the top. FBC the four side of the test. Is oh, yeah. Hold up. Is it obstructive? So the FEV one is seventy five percent. Is the normal eighty to eighty five for FEV one percent? No. All right, Kara, you keep shaking your head at me. So I'm gonna bring Kara into this because I want her to help me, but I also want to figure it out myself. So the 75% is still within the normal value. So it's 75 to 85? Yes. Okay. And then the FVC is lower, right? Yes. So then it would be restricted, right? Because there's still the diffusion that's... There you go. Sorry, I just had a guess and had to say it out loud. Yeah, it's all good. All right. Um, what was the answer? Restrictive. All right, not easy, but you guys are getting there. You're getting to the point where I can give you the, everything here and you can just focus in on the main things, right? And what, all right. Have made, what could have made that um, obstructive though? Would have been the SVC or FRFEC? 
numbers or be the, the FEV one? The FEV one percent, uh, and then if you look at the twenty five to seventy five, one hundred percent peak expiratory flow, eighty percent and above is normal. So those were good. So the big issue here is that this was at seventy four percent, then that would technically be a combined condition. So the FEV one is looking at the diffusion. Uh, not diffusion, but the flow rate. That's the primary flow rate. The DLCO is diffusion, and that's not on here. Okay. Yes, the reason why it's not combined is that this is at 75%, which is with the normal limits. So we have low volumes, normal flow rate. So by definition, this is just restrictive. So this would be our Mick Jagger case without having emphysema, right? Lung cancer emphysema. All right, two or three more. So we'll do Alyssa, Kristen, and Terry, and then we'll call it good. And if you want to stay and do more of this, we can. All right, so Alyssa, you ready? Yes. All right, explain the steps on how to do best test results. Okay, so first you do the highest forced. Step one, highest force vital capacity. Um, and then the highest FEV 1%? Or, yeah, right? Or just one, not the percent. Okay, highest FEV 1 value. Yes, not the percent. Um, and then you divide both of those together, right? You divide the best test of the FEV or FVC and the FEV 1. Okay, so that gives me my new FEV 1% for the best test. Yeah. And then um, the, then you add them, the, find the sum from each trial. So you add FEV 1 and FVC from trial 1, trial 2, trial 3, right, from those trials. And then whichever one has the highest sum is the best test in the, the other ones. <laughs> okay. Like without the like showing you. So what do I bring over from the one that has the highest sum in uh, FEV1 FEC? Whichever has the highest uh, trial. Right, so what do I bring over? What, what do I do? What do I transfer over to the best test side? All the... The highest one? I don't know what you're asking. <laughs> so I've added up my FEV1 FVCs. I got the highest numerical sum of, let's say, trial one. Now I take all the what things from that trial one to transfer over oh. to the best test. Flows, yeah. So the 25 to 75, 200 to 1200, PEFR, right, all that stuff. Transfer that over. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Good job. All right, Kristen, you ready? Or is it Kristen? It's Kristen or Kristen? Is she there? Is she in the chat? It's Kirsten, and I don't know that she came back. Oh, Kirsten? Kirsten. Kier? Like I-E? Okay. My bad. All right, uh, Terry. Then Terry will be our last one. You ready? You ready, Terry? I guess so. You were fine with the last one. Don't be nervous. All right. What does bronchoprovocation evaluate? We already talked about it. What does it evaluate? What does it look at? What's the purpose behind methicoline challenging? Clive, can you help me? Yeah, doesn't it look at restrictive? No. Mm. I have to do a penalty slide here. Oh, doesn't it look how you can how reversible the bronchospasm is? Reversible? <laughs> or how reactive your lungs are? How sensitive your lungs are. Yeah. So reversibility is which test? Um, that's the pre and post. 
pre and post bronchodilator. That's reversibility. For how sensitive the tissue is, that is the bronchoprovocation. That's the methicoline challenge. They can do cold air. They can do a bunch of those other things, but. Um, but then you reverse them back. Right. Yeah, the- that's why I put that in the notes. So if you looked at my like master sheet, if you had that printed out with the QR code things on it, um, that's why you'll see that on there where uh, I put on there always reverse bronchospasm after you're done. Uh, yeah, that's a big thing. <laughs> Unless your ER is slow that day, but that's a whole separate uh, scenario. Yeah, reverse that. All right. So what I'll do is I'll officially end our time here. Um, so I want to give you time to do that discussion board. So make sure you do the discussion board, either five questions, exam style questions, uh, and then put the answers in there, like page numbers, slide numbers for those answers. Uh, or you can post a two page study guide for exam one. So please look at that board, look at other people's posts. It helps you mentally prepare for Thursday, right? As much as you can. The sooner you do it, the less stress you'll have Wednesday night into Thursday morning, right? Uh, don't forget to uh, bring a calculator if you need one. Uh, you can't use your phone uh, or your smartwatch. I guess if you had a calculator watch, you could use that. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's something you have. Uh, so uh, be, be prepared for Thursday morning. And then Thursday, bring a, uh, your personal device uh, to take the test on. Let me know as soon as you can. If you do not have something to take the test on here uh, with our Wi-Fi, um, as soon as you can. And I'll print out a couple of paper copies in case we need that. Uh, but do be prepared to also bring your personal device to do the peepity checkoffs, peer checkoffs with each other too. So it has a benefit for that as well. Uh, if you want to stay and go through more questions and stuff, you feel free to do so. Uh, other than that, I will release you to go study for the exam uh, and do your discussion post. Hopefully you had a little bit of fun with the escape room thing one question at a time. Do I know it or not? So I, I like doing those. To, oh, sorry, Jason. Oh, no, that's all. I, I just like doing stuff like that. Okay, I just wanted to confirm. So the bronco provocation induces a bronchospasm if they're like sensitive or reactive. Yeah, if it gets to a high enough dose, it'll make even normal lung tissue bronchospasm. But we're just trying to see how incredibly sensitive is their, how severe roughly is their asthma or how sensitive their airways are. We can't officially diagnose asthma with bronco provocation. Just like a peak flow can't diagnose asthma, hint. Sounds like a true false question. It can't diagnose asthma. A pre and post bronchodilator can't diagnose asthma. Asthma, we can use those to help tell us how severe their airflow obstruction is, but it's also got to be combined with the right symptoms to be diagnosed with asthma. So that's why asthma is never just a diagnosis straight off of a pulmonary function, any of the pulmonary function tests. It's in, in cahoots with a history and physical. So that's why we can't diagnose asthma just off of a PFT. Sounds like and a question. And, the metha, and so the methacholine challenge, is that different from the bronco provocation? Or like are there two different tests? that? Can no. So bronco provocation is an umbrella term. Okay. We used to use cold air where we'd have you breathe a mask of cold gas, and that would induce a bronchospasm as well. How sensitive are their airways? Make it colder and colder and colder. So it's like a PD-20 with cold air, right? Okay. Colder and colder. How, at what level did you have the 20% drop? But methacholine is a lot more eva- easy to evaluate because we have this concentration and this concentration that we're nebulizing. And we always start off with normal saline. And hopefully you see my note in there that we always start off with normal saline just to sort of see if there's a mental block behind it. And I've seen some people where they don't give me good effort after the normal saline because they think it started the test. And I'm like, huh, I think we need to repeat that one again. <laughs> So we always start with normal saline as a control, right? As science, right? You have to have a control. So that's your control. And then you start with the light, the light doses of methacholine and work your way to the stronger doses. But it's just five breaths with that dose that you currently have. And then they do the, the peak flow or they do the force vital maneuver, but you're looking at their, their FEV 1%. And then we do it five breaths with the next concentration until they hit 20% drop, stop, reverse, and then we record which level they had that 20% drop with or what concentration or dose they had that 20% drop with.
Okay, so like a methylcholine goes underneath that umbrella term of bronchoprovocation. Yeah, that's just one of the drugs that we can use for bronchoprovocation. It's the most commonly used for provocation. Um, there is another drug out there that they can do as well. Uh, they used to do histamine, believe it or not. <laughs> actually give them histamine. But hey, I mean, what are you doing with this test? You're purposely giving someone a bronchospasm that has known reactive airways, right? Danger, right? Danger, Will Robinson. Um, so it's not, it's something weird to wrap your mind around because your whole career is spent on reversing bronchospasm. And what are you doing in the PFD lab with this test? <laughs> You're like, isn't there that whole do no harm thing, the, the Hippocratic, <laughs> like, Okay, so I'm not doing harm because I'm going to reverse it. I have the knowledge to reverse it. And we're trying to see how sensitive it is so we can have a better game plan of how they're going to approach their disease process in general. So do they need inhaled corticosteroids for a better controller medicine? How strong of inhaled corticosteroids do we use? Do we use the high dose of Advair? Do we use the medium dose of Advair? Do we use the pediatric dose of Advair, right? So that's where we can see how sensitive their airways are so we know how strong of drugs we can use with them to help them have a better activities of daily living. So there is a little weirdness to that whole thing, but then it ultimately comes out to where do I, am I the best person to reverse this bronchospasm? Probably, right? <laughs> Respiratory therapy, you're probably the best person to reverse that spasm. And then you can also see how sensitive their airways are so you have a better game plan for better long-term living. So what, I guess what point would they have to get to before you'd be like, okay, we're stopping the test because you're super reactive or, you know, like how far do you take it? Like what's the cutoff point? Oh, so if you go, let me open that up. I think I have that that concentration in there. Where did it have it? Contents. Because so, on, on your notes, it says until a 20% decrease in the Oh, uh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Okay, so here, let me show you this. This is a... a an abandoned PowerPoint that I'm making, uh, but it was too detailed for me to give it to you now, right? So I'll have to figure out how to make it more simple. So just keep that in mind. But I was going to give you more information on um, the uh, methicoline procedure. So here is the procedure example that we did in our PFT lab. So this is the procedure that we did. Um, so this is our policy and procedure. So what we do, uh, discontinue after 20% drop. So you obtain a baseline spirometry, right? Then you do the nebulized saline five breaths, and then you do it. And you keep going until we got to 16 milligrams. If you got to 16 milligrams and you still did not drop your 20%, we called it normal spirometry. So you weren't considered hyperreactive. If you go to the 20 to 25 milligrams per ml, that's usually where even normal lungs will start to have bronchospasm. Is that what you guys were looking at? Like what dose? <laughs> yeah, so usually 16 is where we would end it. That was our procedure anyway. That's what our physicians would go by. And this is one of the ATS procedures. But I had all these like, I had preparations, like they can't have asabas within the past four to six hours, contraindications, right? So. Um, and a, a very detailed PowerPoint that I abandoned early on because I was making it too complex. <laughs> but hopefully that's what, if that's what you were looking for, that's where we would terminate there is usually at 16. If you didn't drop 20%, then we would call it, that's the end of the procedure. Is that in the, not this slide right here, but I, I can't find any of that in our, in like in my notes from the PowerPoint. No, so that is not. So I got this from Medscape. So Medscape, I love Medscape, but uh, Medscape sort of gives you quick and dirty of like six minute walk tests, PFTs, things like that. The ATS, and they use the ATS um, criteria on there. Um, so if you go to Medscape, if you don't have an account on there, it's free. Um, but, uh, and you can look up diseases. Tell me everything about asthma. It tells you diagnosis, treatment, x-rays, labs, all those other things that are associated with that process, ARDS, so on and so forth. Uh, but even does 
uh, things like this, like Methicoline Challenge, it has little blurbs about it on there that makes it short and sweet, right? It's a simple way to look at it compared to a whole chapter on this. So this is not in your Blackboard or, or anything right now. Uh, this is something I was creating for Blackboard as an extra resource document, which is what I might do out there, just make an extra resource for people that are more curious about it. Uh, same thing with the six minute walk, but I put a video about the six minute walk in there too. Um, so that way you'll get that in advanced diagnostics, you go over six minute walk. But um, that's where I got this from, if that's what you were asking. So if you want me to make this available to you, I can. It's currently in my junkyard of PowerPoints that I have in the back of my brain. Can we go over the PFT interpretations a little more? I feel like I'm still struggling with that. Perfect. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, a couple of those. So. I use a little box um, thing that Derek gave us in the beginning, and that kind of really helps me to figure out what it is. Oh, so the, um, the score sheet? Yeah, the one that has the SVC, the uh, FV, SVC, FVC, FRC, and then on the for the flow, it's the FEV 1%, the FEF, and then the PEFR. And then I put the normal values next to them. Um, so that little box sheet kind of helps me to interpret the PFT. So you're talking about the scorecard here? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, so right under the peak flow meter video, you're going to see PFT scorecard. Yeah, it's hard to see when you have the digital backgrounds. Preaching to the choir there. All right, so this is, I believe, what you're... There it is. Yeah, so this is what I would do. So I'd look at slow water capacity. If it's low, right, if all these categories were low, And then all of these categories, my flow rates were normal. Normal. And normal. So this is something, if you're going to memory dump for the exam, like if that's something that you like to do, like draw the, the volume capacity box recommended, uh, or do something like this to sort of help you with those interpretations on the exam, because there's a couple, I think there's about three or four off the top of my head, there's about three or four of those on the exam where you have to interpret the PFT like what we're doing today. Um, this is sort of something that you could quick uh, draw out, slow vital, force vital, um, and then FEV1 uh, percent and peak flow or something like that. Um, so that way you know if the volumes are low, then this is restrictive disease. If the flow rates are low, then it's obstructive. If both of them are low, both categories combined. So this is a way to sort of keep it as simple as possible when you look at that whole sheet of all those values. Oh, heavens to Betsy, right? That's gonna throw your brain off. So this is a way if we go back into the case study one, if I have, I don't have the case study one up, so I'd have to go back. And case study one is a good way to uh, look at this. So if we go to case study one, it's going to take a while for me to download it, but that's the one with uh, Darth Vader and Spock. Um, there we go. PFT case studies. Right under the scorecard. Uh, and Queen Latifah. That's another good way to practice those as well. And then I had a couple on the PowerPoint too. So if you go to his uh, case study PFT, so if we go to Spock's um, PFT, then you can look at his slow vital capacity and force vital capacity. Well, slow vital capacity is normal. So if we look at this on the scorecard, Oh, it's going to be too tiny. All right. 
So if we look at this on the PFT scorecard, his slow vital capacity was normal. So because his slow vital capacity is normal, that means one of his volume or his capacity, his, his lung capacities are within normal limits. So you can't have a restrictive disease and have a normal slow vital capacity. So I don't even have to move any further. I know that he has a normal capacity, normal volume. So now I'm just going to look at his flow rates. His FEV 1% is 63%, which I know normal is 25, uh, 75 to 85%. So I know that's low. His 25 to 75% down here, normal is 80 to 100%. So that's low. And then his peak expiratory flow rate, is it even on here? Yeah, it is 66%. It's normals 80 to 100, uh, 80 to 120. So when I'm looking at Spock's PFT here, I see that he doesn't have a restrictive issue, but he definitely has an obstructive issue. So when it comes to the FEV1, if it's low, it's most likely obstructive. Like this is just like not for every case. And then if it's normal, it's restrictive. So if the, P, if the FEV1 is low, then we're looking at an obstructive issue. Can it be a combined obstructive and restrictive? Yeah, so, but we, that's why we gotta look at both volumes and flow rates on each PFT. We gotta look at both, right? That's why they're both here for the scorecard. We gotta look at both volumes and flow rates. These are the basic ones to look at, slow vital, force vital, and then FEV 1%. If you wanna simplify it to just that, then that's fine, right? For now, until you guys get out there, we're, PFT line gets a little more complex. Um, but when you're looking at this, if it, if the FEV1% is normal, is what you were saying, if the FEV1% is normal, does it mean it's restrictive? No, let's, what if their volumes are, were normal? Then they have normal spirometry. But if his, his FEC is low, right? The FVC would just be like air trapping. That's why you have to go off the SVC. Yeah, because his force vital capacity was low. So when you see this pattern, that's your classic air trapping pattern. When you have a low forced, but a normal slow, that's your classic air trapping. And that can happen during an asthmatic episode. Someone's having an asthma attack, if you were, in theory, able to do a PFT on them, which they're not going to be able to during an asthma attack, but in theory, if you were able to do that, uh, you would see this same pattern, right, because of air trapping on that process. Is it also the same pattern as, as FRC is so high? Yes, because this, and it on this case, his FRC was 130%. So, yeah, that was air trapping because what's FRC is what's stuck in there. Okay, it's, that makes sense now. Yeah, it's what's left over. It can't get exhaled. That FRC stuck in there. So that's why on his case study here, this is a classic emphysema case study, classic COPD cases study here. So low flow rates, um, high residual volumes, high residual capacities volumes. But his uh, capacity was normal, if not increased. When you look at his total lung capacity, it was 126% or 132%, sorry, 132% down here, right? That's because stretched out floppy columnar lungs, right? They lost that elasticity and now they're super stretched out. So for the SVC and the FVC, for those predicted value percentages, you want them in between 80 and 100 or 80 and 120? Yeah, so let's do this. Basically, all the values are 80 to 120, except the FEV 1% is the 75 to 85. Yeah. Yeah, but like when we're like looking at the actual like interpretations and like he kept going to that percentage area and it was like 65 or whatever, that was low. That just tells you that it's not normal. Yeah, so that's where all you'll see like percent of predicted here. Um, and so his total lung capacity was 132% of predicted, which is way higher than normal, right? Um, but yeah, that's what you'll see is I'll put it in percent of predicted there, but the FEV1, you won't see it. It'll just be measured, 
right? We measured his FEV1% and his FEV1% was 63%. You're not going to see it in that far category, like what we were seeing today in the, in the game. Is that where you were asking, like the... Yeah, because I was just kind of, um, like when we kept going to the uh, SVC and FBC, like the percentage range, I was getting a little confused. I think I was comparing it to the FEV, like 75 to 85. But then I went back and looked at my notes and I seen that it was 80 to 120 is that percentage yeah. for those two results. So I was just confirming that when it comes to those ones, we're looking for 80 to 120 to determine if it's normal. And then for the FEV one, we're looking at 75 to 85. For Precisely. That is a true statement. Is this format right here the, the one we'll see on the test? Correct. This is the format that I put in the escape room. Yeah. You're not going to see this first one, unfortunately, where I'm like, here you go. But I wanted to warm you up, right? <laughs> This would be too easy. You guys got this. You're way more advanced than that one. This is you right now. You're going to look like a genius for looking at this, looking at like three values and be like, I got it. I'm only looking at force vital, slow vital, and FEV 1%. Did I look at anything else? No. Now, real world, so are we going to go ahead? On the last one in the escape room, both the SBC and F, um, FEC were both 65%. And they're both low, so how come that wouldn't be combined? So both of those are volumes, right? Both of those tell you the how much the container holds, and both of those the container is small, so that's a restrictive issue. And then the FEV one percent is seventy five percent, so normal seventy five to eighty five percent. So that patient is within normal limits, sort of like having a pH of seven three five. It's still within normal limits, 735 to 745. So you can't say that they have an acidosis when their pH is normal. So same thing here. Even though that's on the lower edge of being a combined, right? You're like, that's pretty close to being combined. They are, but they're not there yet. According to the metrics, they're still just a restrictive issue. So you would have to wait when we're out in the field we have to wait till they hit that low number like even if they're super super close like we can't determine that unless they're actually in the range and there's like a backup like with their pH and stuff we have to actually wait for it to get in that range to do to determine yeah so like just with like any like results we're looking at, like we can't really round them really. We have to make sure they're actually hitting those numbers. Precisely. Not even if, not even if it's super close like that. Like it has to be. Yeah, they earned it. They earned the chance to be within normal limits on this peak flow that we just seen with this uh, escape room uh, scenario. They earned that, right? Their metrics show they're within normal limits for the high age gender. So they've earned it. That's so normal. I, I can't, no one can say that they're obstructive. We could say they have obstructive tendencies, right? But they can't be diagnosed with that. Now they could be, say, you have obstructive tendencies and you have symptoms of reactive airways as far as like history and physical. That's up to the physician to diagnose from there. But this is a patient where, if they, let's say this exact patient has these PFTs and the doc's like, I think they have reactive airways. Let's do a pre and post. And maybe we do a pre and post and there's a 12% increase. Then we show that they're reactive. And so they respond to it. Or maybe they're, they want to do a methicolin challenge and see how sensitive their airways are. Then we can do that. But yeah, with this situation here, they if they're truly looking for obstructive airways, they could either do a, a pre and post or uh, a bronchial provocation. But this is super detailed. I don't want you guys to get caught in the weeds here. But as far as interpretation goes, the only things I want you to zoom in on, right, as far as interpretation goes for the test and just starting off PFT world is slow vital, force vital, and FEV 1%. Those are the ones I want you to zoom in on. Okay, keep it simple, right? Just zoom in on slow vital force vital, just like this first one up here, right? I only give you three values, right? This is sort of where your brain's gotta uh, block out some of the other stuff. So zoom in on slow vital force vital and FEV 1%. So this one will tell you obstructive. It's the best test to evaluate obstructive airways. 
Okay. There's not something in my eye, is there? Okay. And then you have your capacities or volumes, right? If your slow vital by nature is normal, then it can't be restrictive. If this slow vital is normal, there's no way it's restrictive because that container is a normal size. Even if the force vital is low, like what you see here, that container held a normal amount of air. It's just when we forced it, that's when it changed. So if the slow vital is normal and the flow is low, we got obstruction. So could you ask like, what does what disease does this show and then give an example? So we have to say like, this is obstructive. So it could be cystic fibrosis. So what I would do in that scenario, since you guys haven't had disease class, uh, A, that's kind of cruel, but I like the idea. So what I would do, I'm just having fun. Uh, what I would do, I would do that. Um, and I'd be like, okay, which of the following diseases uh, would fit this pattern, but only one of them would be obstructive. So in this scenario here, like looking at this question, 88%, so normal capacity, but a low flow rate. So I'd put like asthma there and the rest of it would be like pulmonary fibrosis, pleural fusion, like it would be restrictive. The other three would be restricted. So then you would be forced to take the asthma one, so right? make it like pretty obvious. Like, yeah, because you haven't course. had disease class yet. Okay. <laughs> like, I'm I not. Just, I just wanted, I could see that potentially being a good question. So that's what yeah, but if it is in there, it would be obvious. I would try to make it as obvious as I could. <laughs> Can I confirm with you like, what I think that the test is looking at, just like based off my head, just so you can correct me real quick. So for the slow vital capacity, it's looking at uh, lung volumes for more restrictive processes. And then the forced vital capacity is lung volumes for restrictive, but also it gives you the flow for obstructive. And then for the MVV, it's like just the normal inspiration and expiration if it's the breathing's normal is that right yeah so that one looks at muscle coordination um so your spinal cord injuries uh smas guillain your neuromuscular conditions um the spinal cord injury patients their mvb would be off and then for a dlco is that gas diffusion between the lungs and the blood yep how easy or hard it is to get oxygen into your bloodstream from your lungs and that's what the, i would tell patients the peak flow is just for more obstructive, like the degree of an obstruction. Yeah, so I would tell patients, like, this sees how fast you can blow out. And when people have things like asthma or COPD, it makes it hard for them to get gas out of their lungs very fast. And so that's what this looks at, how fast you can get that air out of your lungs. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I at least knew what they're looking at, because that's going to probably help me more with the results. <laughs> And that's why that assignment for last Thursday, was it, with the, doing the, the table? I like doing that because that sort of looks at, if you can explain it in a, in a simple way to a patient, like, hey, okay, we're going to do the slow vital capacity. This looks at how deep you can inhale and then all the way exhale without having to blow out. So I'm looking at how much air your lungs can hold. All right, so let's do it. So we do that. This one's going to be the same test, but I'm going to have you breathe out as fast, as hard as you can. And this looks at how fast you can get that big volume of air out. So how fast you can get that big breath out, right? And then we go on to the um, DLCO. This one looks a little bit different. We're going to inhale, hold it, and then exhale. This one's going to see how easy it is for oxygen to get into your bloodstream. We'll do this one twice. So that was my thing for the DLCO. Then we're going to go to the MVV. I'm like, so this one's going to be uh, you breathing deep and fast as possible. We're going to only do it a couple times. And I just want to see how much gas you can move over the course of 12 seconds. And so this tells me about how well your lung muscles are, right? And I would use lung muscles uh, for them, like how well your lung muscles are working and how well your brain tells you how fast to breathe and all that stuff. So it'll give us a lot of good overall information. So even though for the MVB, you're kind of doing bigger um, inspiration and expirations, it's not so much anything with um, gas flow. It's more of the physical, like lung muscle. Yeah, it's that neuromuscular connection that we're looking at there. And so our GBMs, our glioblastoma, our brain tumor patients, 
uh, glioblastoma and meningiomas. That was that between that and the DLCO is the only test that are those doctors, the the um, the cancer doctors uh, would pay attention to was just that and the DLCO, MVB and DLCO. Because if they can coordinate, that's also a good sign as far as the brain tumor is concerned, as well as uh, are they given the right dose of radiation or chemotherapy, sorry, chemotherapy uh, that's not destroying their tissue because chemotherapy can cause ILD issues if it's too strong. So just looking at the DLCO, like the decreased, um, the things that can make it decreased, and you had list bronchiolitis obliterans, obliterans. What Ooh. I don't know. What is what is that? Block, bronchiolitis obliterans optimizing pneumonia. Boop. B O O P. I'm not making that up. Okay. All right. You can Google that right Boop. now. B O O P, like pneumonia. Bronchial. Uh, I can't even say it. But boop is a pneumonia. Uh, it's an obliterans pneumonia. It's an optimizing pneumonia. So that is one of those things that can be a part of the differential. That's why PFTs have to be sometimes associated with also doing a diagnostic bronchoscopy, where we go in and we actually take a sample from the lungs, whether it's histological, like an actual tissue sample, or we push a bunch of saline in, suck that saline out, and run that for things like a pneumonia pathologies, and there are fungal pathologies or things like that. So PFTs just, are never alone. Go ahead. Okay, so it's just it's a type of pneumonia then. Boop. Yeah, it's okay. a type of pneumonia which would be a restrictive yeah. uh, issue. So if it's not one of those five obstructive diseases, mm -hmm. then it's restrictive. If I said you have a, a, um, a spinal cord injury, that's restrictive. Third trimester pregnancy, restrictive, right? You name it. Kyphoscoliosis is restrictive. If it's not one of those five, then it's probably restrictive. People think pneumonia is obstructive. Uh, no, pneumonia is usually not obstructive, but on COPD patients who tend to get pneumonia the most out of a lot of people, then they have a combined condition when they get a pneumonia. That's what makes it very deadly for people with COPD to get a pneumonia because not only do they have a baseline obstructive condition like we see with Jagger, but now they also have a restrictive condition on top of it. Both of those combined are going to make it hard. That shunting is severe then because they already have that shunt of the COPD emphysema. Now they also have the shunt of like a pleural fusion, like what we've seen today. You add those together or the shunt of a pneumonia, like we've seen, like that patient would have, you're going to see a hard time getting oxygen into their bloodstream. You're going to see it be very, very high oxygen requirements. And that's what makes it very deadly for COPD years to get pneumonias. Thank you. That's extra. You guys yeah, are above that, and beyond. Yeah, extra kind of helps sometimes. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. I just want you to know that it's extra. So yeah, that way you know not to stress yourself on those. If you want just the general concept, good. I just don't want you to... I'm trying to save gray hairs here. <laughs> on the... Um, I know you said it earlier, we were talking about the body box, the nitrogen washout and the helium dilution. You said that's to find the residual volume. But I, I don't know if somebody said it on the uh, the study guide that said TLC. Mm -hmm. Just change that, right? Or is it both? It's both. So I can get a vital capacity from bedside spirometry, right? That's the forced vital capacity or slow vital capacity. I can get your vital capacity, but what's missing? If you look at your volume and capacity box, what's missing? Between the two? Yeah. If I do a force, if I do a vital capacity maneuver with you, what am I missing to get your total lung capacity? What am I missing? the inspiratory capacity, vital capacity, and the functional residual. So if you look at vital capacity on the box, right, what's missing? If I have you do a forced vital capacity, what's one of those things that I can't measure with the vital capacity maneuver? What's left over? Is it inspiratory? No, because I have you, you, vital capacity includes inspiratory. IRV, tidal volume, and ERV are all included in vital capacity. What's missing? Oh, resi residual volume. Residual volume. So I can't tell what your total lung capacity is without measuring residual volume. Okay, that makes sense. So in order to get your total lung capacity, I need to measure residual volume and then add that to your vital capacity. Now I have your TLC. Okay, that makes, that makes sense now. Yeah. So remember residual volume, you can't exhale it. It's in you until the day you die, unless something weird happens to your chest wall until the day you die, right? That's that negative pleural pressure that's constantly keeping that area open. You can't exhale it. So the only way to do it, body box, Boyle's law, 
Uh, helium dilution, closed circuit is the fancy term they'll put there because you don't want helium being uh, there. Or uh, nitrogen washout, which uses 100% oxygen to wash out the nitrogen that's in there. So they get to so the helium and nitrogen washout, pretty similar. You keep breathing this gas until it goes down to a, a known repeatable percent, and that tells you how much volume is left in the lungs. That residual volume, which then you add that to your vital capacity. Now you have TLC. Cool. That makes sense now. Yeah. And it's tough because you guys haven't actually touched this stuff. And I don't have a body box to play with uh, anymore. <laughs> so the answer is both of those are true. It is to get TLC and it is to get RV. But the idea is to get RV so then you can get TLC. And like with for the TLC, like so if someone has like an obstructive it would be their normal or increased, right? Because of the air trapping. Yeah, normal to increased. increased? Okay. Yeah, and FRC is going to be the big one for uh, uh, air trappers. FRC. Mm -hmm. You're going to see that on the boards. And you're going to see that in real life too. FRC is increased. Um, and TLC definitely can be. Just understand if someone has CHF and emphysema, very common. 50% of people that have COPD have CHF, right? So that what does that do to your lung volumes if you have CHF? if the heart's big, cardiomegaly. It's gonna reduce your volumes. Yeah, so just be careful of that, right? So you're gonna to have to know your patient, the complexities of what we do, right? But their FRCs would still be big even with cardiomegaly, but their TLC would, would be normal in that case. So the FRC would still be normal because of air trapping, but they couldn't, the TLC would, because they can't inhale as much, right? Because of the Yeah, so TLC heart. would be normal okay. if you had a CHF or emphysema, right? Yeah. So let's say you got someone with COPD, CHF, okay? And then you did a TLC would be normal in theory and their FRC would still be high. That's why we still go by FRCs more than TLCs on those patients. Okay, that makes sense. I know your brains are like, ah. <laughs> My head feels very full right now. <laughs> Yeah, between these two courses, uh, then we go into EKGs, which can be a little bit of fool, but like I said, Gina and I are working on some things to help um, make it more digestible here. So hopefully that helps a little bit too. I mean, uh, the big thing here as far as like the EKG stuff, I know your brains are focused on PFT and farm, and there's some farm stuff in, in this book too, of course. But um, when you start looking at the EKGs, go to that EKG section if you don't have a background in EKGs and start looking at some of that just to get that baseline understanding, the basic stuff. That way, when you go into those really boring lectures that I have, um, it doesn't get overwhelming. And I don't want this material to get overwhelming. It's super easy for it to get overwhelming. But try to focus on the big picture and we can zoom in from there. Because now we're talking about FRCs and TLCs with CHF and emphysema. You know how detailed that is in the PFT world? <laughs> yeah. So get the big concepts, flow rates versus volumes. Uh, and then obviously, you know, you'll have a test over that. But the EKG stuff, when you guys are going to move into that, um, try to get the big overview. Don't let it overwhelm you. It's very easy to do that. Uh, but I'll try to make it a little bit more digestible too. We'll focus on the big things. We'll focus on the big things. You have other classes that also go over this material too. I'm just trying to get you introduced to it. Toe in the water. I do like that you kind of like incorporate like a little bit of like you've incorporated it's like some minor farm concepts like throughout all of your classes. So I kind of appreciate having just like that little snippet of different things throughout your classes. Yeah, farm, when I went through it, I'm like, this class is, it was a blitz, right? It's just crazy. Um, and then when I got there as a provider, you know what one of the most important classes that you have gone through as a provider is? Pharmacology, yeah. Critical care provider, pharmacology. Emergency room provider, pharmacology. NICU, neonatal high-risk deliveries, pharmacology. We're using xanthines on newborn babies that have apnea prematurity. We're using bronchodilators. Some of these babies don't have mucins in their mucus yet. So we use uh, the DNA reducing mucolytic on there, the pulmozyme, right? So like there's so much pharmacology that is in what we do and it's just such a blitz. And I wish there was something we could do about it, but it's one of those classes that you're like oh, going through it. But when you get out there, you're like, okay, 
right? This is where it all meets the road. It's tough. I feel like tomorrow or tomorrow, yesterday, uh, going into the class, I was just like, God, this sucks. I hate this class. But it like started finally clicking yesterday. And so by the time I got done with yesterday's lecture, I was like, okay, this is starting to make sense now. And it that was just like a relief because I was struggling so far, but I feel like I, I got a good hang on it now. I think it's hard too because we don't have a calendar. We don't know when stuff is due to like you got a heavy workload too. I'm like, so yeah, like I, I asked him, I was like, can you please post the due dates? Because I'm like losing my mind. Like, we don't have a calendar, so I can't plan. My, my fiance is like, you have another class besides farm because I'm always like, farm, 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 farm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I got a PFT test too. But when I have the class with you, I can I understand it. I digest it. But farm, I'm just like, oh, there's so much. It's so much Ugh. in it's a short period of time. It is. And I'll be as gentle with you guys as I can. But it is it is a blitz no matter who's teaching it. I'm glad I got this one. <laughs> can you just tell him to make a calendar for us? Uh, it's tough. Um, I think things were thrown off too when we had to go online a little bit there too. So I think that threw off a little bit of his activities. It throws off my activities coming with you guys too because I'm creating things for online activities because in class we wouldn't be doing this. We'd be practicing. Today would be all about practicing PFTs and doing checkoffs and stuff. And so I had to create the activities for today. So I, it's just tough because it does throw uh, you off as a teacher and stuff like that. So it's tough to sort of stay on that. It's tough to make a calendar when okay, thank you you're, for you're creating content. But um, as far as um, I think you guys will be fine. And then as far as farm goes, if you made a, fl a mental flow chart, I wish I could make a, I have a mental flow chart in my brain on uh, which category of drugs to use when type thing. Like, when do I use the mucolytics? When do I use the bronchodilators? When do I use the long acting bronchodilators? When do I use the, when do I use the xanthines? Right, things like that. So do a mental flow chart thing if, if that might help you understand the big picture of it too. Is that what, like he, um... Geez, I can't even talk. <laughs> Is that what the mind mapping thing was that he was talking about the other day in class? It's very know. similar to mind mapping. Yeah. I need, to, I need to come up with something like that. Yeah. So I'd put, uh, and so you just like that PFT flow chart where it's like their, their flow rates are low, go to this arm. If their flow rates are normal, go to this arm, right? So a similar thing that I did my mentally, my I should draw it out one day but i did that have that for farm like if someone had uh post-op surgery they had abdominal surgery they're gonna be breathing deep are their cilia paralyzed no their cilia are paralyzed and they're not going to be breathing deep so i need to do volume expansion therapy hey does a bronchodilator help with volume expansion of their lungs and wake up cilia yeah so the bronchodilators in that arm for my brain right Right. And so that's something that I did that helps me understand the general concept. Inhale corticosteroids, they're not for rescue. Systemic steroids are for rescue. You show up to an ER, they're not going to give you a, a flow vent inhaler. Right. They're going to give you systemic steroids. Right. IV, uh, PO steroids. Uh, that's going to help you in that moment. But they're for controlling and symptoms type thing. So and we'll talk more farm too in disease class. So don't worry. Right, you'll get reinforcement through the rest of the program of other things too. In therapeutics, are you going to talk about farm and therapeutics? Yes. Mechanical ventilation. Yes. Critical care techniques class with me. Yes, you'll talk about farm. Advanced pharmacology. You'll talk about farm. Yeah. So you're going to get more of it. So you'll be fine. So now to go in like a totally different direction, but in today's case studies, you had us calculate lung compliance in raw. Is that something that's expected of us on this exam on Thursday to calculate? No, I just compliance? wanted you to correlate raw and compliance with obstructive and restrictive pathologies. Okay. I just wanted yeah. to make, I mean, like I know how, but like, I just, do I need to like focus on that? Like, is that something I need to be worried about? Do I need to remember the calculation? I would say in general, yes, but yeah. for the test, no. Okay. I won't make you calculate raw or compliance. The only thing that I think you'll have to calculate is if there's a 12% increase or the best test results. But um, yeah, I don't have a lot of calculations on this one. 
I don't have a CO2, CCO2 shunt. I don't have all that stuff on there, but yeah, that's not on there. But I wanted you to associate raw with obstructive and compliance with restrictive. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I just wanted to know if we had to actually like do the calculation. Yeah, well, the more your brain, so I'm doing that whole brain memory thing, the long-term memory, the more I have you recall that first semester stuff over time, the more it's just going to sit in there permanently. It's my, my programming. Then when you're on stage at Vegas for nationals, you'll actually remember that it's a three liter super syringe at three different flow rates. Yeah. And you won't make me look like a dork, <laughs> but come on. <laughs> you knew the answer. All right. Thank you. I think I'm good. All right. Um, do y'all know if we have, we don't have an MRE or a test tomorrow in farm, do we? We have the calculations one, but it's not due till Sunday. Oh, that's right. Did you guys do the MRE for yesterday? That one's due tonight, right? Yeah. I did it yesterday. It's not bad. Yeah. And the work workbooks are shorter than the previous chapters, so that's good. Dude, when he was like, oh, you guys don't have to turn them in, I was like, no, we're going to turn them in because I spent my whole weekend doing all those workbooks. Did you? Give me something. <laughs> That's what I'm doing all day Sundays. Oh, wow. I'm halfway yeah. I'm halfway done with them, but I'm gonna finish the rest on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, same okay. with Ralph. That's when it was like.